right, welcome everyone to uh, the sixth annual Innovate for Good. I'm Billy Riggs, and we are ready to go today with our, our first event back in person. And so I want to kick us off by introducing the Dean of the School of Management, Charles Moses. Thank you for being here. Welcome us, Charles. Th thanks very much, Billy. Welcome to our sixth annual Innovate for Good conference, a collaboration between the University of San Francisco and the Commonwealth Club. We're glad that you can join us today for an exciting afternoon of discussions around social innovation that will focus on one of the most critical issues of our time, and that is the climate crisis. This conference was made possible through a legacy endowment honoring the work of Dr. Oren Harari, a faculty member of our School of Management. Dr. Harari was a compassionate and driven educator, an inspirational consultant, and an internationally renowned strategy and leadership scholar. This philosophy of engaging innovative leadership for social benefit, a direct embodiment of the university's mission, a leadership perspective that em emphasizes producing greater stakeholder value. Today's conference brings together business, government, and nonprofit leaders to discuss sustainable business practices, social impact investing, and social innovation in our cities and the environment. The afternoon promises to be a rich dialogue on how all of us can become the change, driven, passionate, courageous, disciplined, inclusive, optimistic, and performance-driven le performance leaders like Dr. Harari. I do want to take a moment to thank the team that put this together. And they do a great job for us every year. First of all, the staff and AV support of the Commonwealth Club. You don't see them. They're back there, but they're around. They're doing great work for us. Also, Daniel Glenn and Tanya Alvarez uh, from the School of Management, plus many others that made this day possible. Thank you, for, thank you all for your work and, produce, and for producing this work, this event, excuse me. I'd also like to thank, acknowledge the members of my dean circle, uh, who are very, very important and critical to what we do at the School of Management, who are here today. We hope you enjoy the afternoon, and now I'll turn you back over to the event chair and your host, Dr. Billy Rigg. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. All right, thank you all for being here. So before we get started, and I I'm, I'm, couldn't be thrilled to be here, more to be here today. It's been, it's been too long. Um, I love this place. Thanks to the Commonwealth Club. We actually are trying to make things interactive as possible. We're gonna have a couple, we're gonna have more people spilling in throughout the day. Um, a lot of phenomenal speakers. We've been doing this, I've been doing this for I think three years now, and this lineup is, is the best lineup we've ever had, so uh, just, just could not be more thrilled. Um, but we actually are gonna do some interactive polling, and I'm gonna keep this up. Um, if you've been to anything I've done before, you know, many times we'll try to actually get you to engage with us. So if you go to uh, poll EV and I think there's an add in error. What does that mean there? Can somebody click my that that thing on the top of that screen? Just say retry. Um, I, uh, we can just uh, see if this will this will work for us. But we're gonna try to uh, we're gonna try to get some some feedback from y'all. Um, and uh, so that should be up for a while. If it's not working, we'll figure out the uh, that. But what you know, what does it mean to innovate for good? Um, and so we're going to do, be doing some polling. This will be live throughout the uh, first part of our session today. Uh, if you go to poll.ev or pollev.com and uh, uh, innovate for good, backslash innovate for good. So uh, we heard from Charles. Uh, we encourage you to go to the, EV, the, uh, the URL again, pollev.com, innovate for good. We encourage you to be social on your whatever social stuff you do. We're your University of San Francisco on LinkedIn, University of San Francisco School of Management. This is the Commonwealth Club of California, if you want to tag them in a the link. So just make sure you do that. Um, if you're comfortable without a mask, everyone here has shown proof of vaccination. Uh, that's fine. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, if, you're, if you want to wear a mask, we, we do encourage that and we respect that and show empathy for that. Um, flow of the day is we're going to have some amazing sessions after, and some amazing conversations. We're going to take a short break around, uh, around 
250 or so, 255, but don't go anywhere because we'll have another panel. And then we've got an amazing conclusion uh, with an incredible speaker at the end of the day. Um, we're live streaming on the School of Management and Commonwealth Club website. So um, if you want to send that to all your friends that are in different parts of the country. Uh, and uh, I'm Billy Riggs. I'm a professor at the University of San Francisco, if you didn't uh, we knew that. And uh, I direct the Masters of Public Administration program, uh, teaching entrepreneurship and the MBA program. And just really happy to have you guys here. Uh, and without further ado, I want to welcome our first speaker to the stage, uh, and, uh, Diana Hagen, who is co-founder of Point Reyes Farmstead Cheenery. Uh, she's co-owner of, of Point Reyes Farmstead Cheenery uh, Creamery. Uh, she also is the CFO and is really going to come and talk to us about some of the challenges and opportunities she faces at her organization. And she has a couple slides to share with us to start off with as well. So without further ado, welcome Diana. Uh, to the stage. Thanks. Hi. Hey, How's everybody. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so, um, go ahead. Yeah, well, Diana's fresh off a plane from Oregon, I oh, think. Yes. <laughs> and, um, so just getting your bearings. But uh, Diana, maybe you could just start off by in introducing yourself to our viewers and our audience and kind of who you are, what your story is, and how you came to be uh, a co-owner of this amazing creamery in Marin. Sure. Um, well, uh, I grew up on a dairy farm in Point Reyes, just outside of the town of Point Reyes. I don't know how many people in the audience are familiar with that out in West Marin. Uh, <laughs> great, I see a lot of show of hands. Um, and uh, didn't really know anything different. Um, my, my parents bought the farm in 1959. Um, my dad was a second generation dairy farmer. His father had a dairy farm as well in the town of Point Reyes. Um, and that was kind of the life um, of uh, living on a farm. You know, we started with 150 cows, grew to about 500, milking about 500 cows in the late 90s and sold all of the milk, 100% of the milk that was produced on the farm uh, didn't really control any of the end product. Um, I am one of four sisters um, and uh, no, no boys in the family. Um, my, my dad really wanted that boy but didn't quite end up with that. My mom was in education and she actually uh, encouraged all of us to leave the farm and get uh, a college degree and, and go do something else because she saw that you know dairy farming is um, it's challenging it's very labor intensive and you're you know really kind of tied to the farm 24 7 and i think she wanted something different for us so all of my sisters and i went off and got degrees and uh, various business degrees as it turns out um, uh, one of my sisters was in marketing one was in sales and operations i was in finance and we like to say it was a little bit by design. Yeah, <laughs> because, <team. Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> um, and so flash forward to uh, the mid 90s and the artisan cheese industry in California was really starting to get off the ground um, and becoming a real um, uh, industry in the North Bay, specifically uh, Marin and Sonoma County. And I think my dad, after 40 years of selling the milk, was like, we can do something. We can have a value added product with the milk that we're producing here. So he brought my sisters and I together and said, all right, this is the deal. I, this is what we want to do. Um, but we're in our you know, early 60s and we need some of you to come into the business and help us get this off the ground. Um, it's not really going to pay much. You'll, you'll get paid in cheese, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> at least until we get this thing going. And um, I, I actually was not one of the, you mentioned I was a co-founder. That's okay, it's totally fine. I, am, uh, I, I was not able to really do it financially. Um, two of my sisters uh, ha were married and had young kids and were like, okay, let's, let's get this thing going. So in 2000, we made our first vat of um, blue cheese. We made one cheese for the first nine years of business. Um, and it's what we're most, well known for. Even today, um, our original blue accounts for about 60% of our uh, overall sales. Um, 
So that's really when we got started in, in 2000 and continually uh, grew the business. Uh, really worked on the brand, first of all. Um, super important for us to establish uh, a, a brand that was going to be uh, known for um, uh, managing land well and cows well and a sense of place, which is why we put Point Reyes in, in the name. Uh, and then really worked on building in uh, sales distribution channels across the country. Um, and again, over those nine years. Uh, so in about 2009, actually, that's when I joined the business. Um, I spent my career 20 plus years in commercial real estate, <laughs> something totally different, working for uh, commercial banks uh, and then ended up at a private equity firm, um, actually only about a block and a half from here, ironically enough, um, and then got caught in the 2008 downturn and um, by that time I had gotten married, had a, a young child and was like, I'm gonna take a couple months off and just kinda see where life takes me. Didn't think anything about going into the family business but kinda got lured into it by my sisters um, and uh, haven't looked back. It's been 13 years now uh, that I've been in the business. It's interesting going from you know, a corporate America where you're kind of responsible uh, for taking care of a certain aspect of a business. But, you know, you go to working in a, one in a family business. So that's really challenging of working with my family, my parents and my sisters. Um, but also where you're responsible for all of these, the livelihood of all these people as well. Um, we've built it up to, we currently have about 100 employees. We produce about uh, two million pounds of cheese. Um, we have, uh, we currently are milking about 430 cows. 100% of that milk that we produce on the farm goes into our cheese. It mostly goes into the original blue that I mentioned uh, is our flagship cheese. Uh, but we do produce other cheeses now as well. And we're even buying milk to uh, help produce uh, the other cheeses we make in a second plant that we built a couple of years ago in Petaluma. Um, so, thanks. I feel like that's kind of yeah, giving you I a little bit of the great, story. A great flavor for where where we're going. So, to just before we go on, I think what is a just so everybody knows, I, what is a farmstead cheese? Just sure. so we understand the terminology. Sure. Um, so what farmstead really means is you're kind of, you're creating a product on the farm with raw materials that you're also producing. So the fact that we're, we're producing the milk uh, that goes into our cheese, um, that cheese then is farmstead. When we first started out, all of the cheeses were produced on the farm. Um, as I mentioned, we're not producing all of them. So we technically have some farmstead cheeses and some that are not. Um, but one other aspect of that is we have what's called a closed herd, which means that we control the whole process of our cows. We, we breed them, we raise the heifers, um, and then milk them, um, and they retire. So we kind of control that whole process as well. So from you know, kind of beginning to, to end till we get the cheese in, in uh, uh, the consumer's mouth. So, so let's uh, like maybe pull on that string a little more, and maybe we can share a graphic in a couple sure. minutes. But um, so we're focused on innovate for good as as a, as a theme, but we're really trying to dial into this. How do we build uh, sustainable businesses and businesses to give back the planet? And maybe you could just talk at a high level on kind of sure. what you're doing and. Uh, what you're doing at the, the cream to really have um, super impact. Um, sure. And uh, I'm not, you know, we, we actually, oh, I see, I see, um, I see movement I in the back. This, so maybe but... just like talk about it for a minute. Okay. And, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> um, um, so sustainability is something that is really important to us. Um, and it's kind of a buzzword that, you know, gets overused in a lot of cases. Um, to, to what that means to us is climate smart improvements um, are really uh, something that we try to focus on. Um, that's taking care of the land, um, not putting too much stress on the land, taking care of the cows, um, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions where we can, um, you know, taking care of our labor force. Um, so it's kind of a you know, high level holistic view of um, 
you know, what sustainability means to us. So I see the slide yeah, has think, come up. Maybe you could just walk us through the property there. I see point, yeah. <laughs> I see the, the Tamales Bay there. Yes, and, so uh, just to orient everyone, um, this is a, a view of our property on a very sunny day with the hills as green as they could possibly be. <laughs> um, but yes, that is Tamales Bay. We're on the uh, eastern shore of Tamales Bay, um, pretty much directly across from the town of Inverness, um, if you're familiar with that. Um, as you can kind of see, it's a lot of undulating hills. So what you see from the road is a bunch of, uh, of green hills, which is great. But the, well, where all the buildings are is kind of tucked in a valley. So we're a little bit hidden from a uh, view of um, uh, at least of driving along Highway 1. But we are right on Highway 1, uh, about a mile off the road to get to the, where the buildings are. Um, and what I love about this slide, this is in our um, marketing efforts. One, um, I didn't point this out, but um, we have transitioned the um, company to, from my parents to my sisters and I, so we are 100% women-owned, which is pretty rare. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Uh, certainly in the dairy industry, it is very rare. Um, and uh, so we like to you know, lead with that. And this, if you can read it, it does show some of the, the different practices that we're doing um, around the farm. Um, one of kind of the slogans that helps people kind of understand this a little bit is we like to say we close the loop on poop. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which, you know, there's a lot of poop on a dairy farm. Um, and, and how to manage that is, um, is really critical, at least in terms of our sustainability practices. And if you think about it, you know, the cows are out eating the grass that's on the, the hills. Um, and then they um, are, um, you can kind of see here where um, those rows you're seeing uh, is us cutting uh, silage, we grow silage, which is ri fermented ryegrass on the property. We actually use the, the, the poop for fertilizer uh, to grow that silage. Um, and then we're feeding that back to the cows who are then producing this really high quality uh, milk. Uh, the whey byproduct from the cheese, which is really high in proteins and minerals, we feed that back to the cows. Um, and then the methane from the, the cow poop is um, captured in a uh, tarp covered methane digester. Actually, if you go back a slide here, you can kind of see that it's right in the forefront, that black tarp. That's our digester pond where we're capturing uh, methane in there. We, we actually separate the, the solids and the liquids. Um, in the manure. The solids we use for uh, bedding for the cows is compost, uh, or we're composting the bedding, and then the, the uh, liquid is going in to fertilize the, the, uh, the fields, as I mentioned, for the silage. We're then also, that methane is getting captured and uh, powers a generator that's producing electricity for the so, farm. Yeah, and if you think about like the way a methane, you know, that, that's basically a big tent mm -hmm. that fills up with, with methane. And then mm -hmm. of course, methane is flammable. So it right. goes back into a biodigester that then consumes that. And then I think, was right. it 60% of your? Uh, it's probably a little bit less only because we're, we're, we have our electricity needs have increased over the years. It's maybe about 50% right now, which is why we're also uh, in the process of reviewing solar option to hopefully cover the difference. We'd really like to, to try to get to 100% sustainability um, for our electricity needs on the farm. Um, what you're seeing here, we did put in solar uh, on the roof of our plant in Petaluma. Um, and so that is covering about 55% of the electricity needs there. It's, it's pretty heavy. Um, equipment that's in there. Uh, we are uh, making all of the our other cheeses, which are all pasture, we pasteurize the milk there, and we're aging. A, a big part of what um, we have in our creamery facility is aging facilities, because our on average our cheese is, is aging about two to three months before it's being sold to distributors. So that takes up a lot of space, a lot of refrigeration. Um, and then we have all of our packaging and distribution at our Petaluma facility as well. Um, so we were seeing, uh, we, we opened that in 2018 that, you know, our um, 
pg and &E bills were quite hefty there, and so it was kind of a focus for us to try to, to get solar onto that property. I think this is so exciting, and, and you know when we met a few couple months ago and I came out that I was, I was like, why aren't you talking about this more? <laughs> this is incredible. Uh, but I, I keep on thinking, you know, this, and we're going to talk a little more about kind of how a lot of our farms and, and ag land can, can fuel urbanity and fuel urban systems more. I think there's some interesting stuff that, for example, mm -hmm. Cruz is doing around this with a, what's called a fleet to farm program we're gonna talk about later, or farm to fleet, sorry, Cruz. Um, sure. <laughs> but it's, well, I will, just to mention on that, because we're also, we, one of the things I think that we do pretty well is we're continually trying to educate ourselves and learn more about different ways we can, um, uh, have an impact and because we've got this digester and we um, uh, pursued a partnership in trying to uh, sell our carbon credits from the digester to a partnership that is um, using it for electric vehicle charging. So it's kind of a laborious process to go through to get approved through the Air uh, Resource Board mm. um, for the low carbon fuel standard pathway that allowed us to then sell the carbon credits. So it just, it's not a lot of dollars, but it just kind of helps kind of expand the story and really shows, um, you know, the different practices that we're doing. Um, and there's some actually really cool things out there too. We, we saw a demonstration for a, a tractor that is being powered by methane. Um, and it's still, it's being developed more so in Europe and they're just doing yeah. kind of pilot program over here, but there could be some, some additional real synergy things. Cause you know, we've got a lot of tractors and they're run on diesel. And if we can try to, um, reduce that footprint as well. Um, we're kind of looking at, at that. Well, I think this is, I mean, I think this really leads to kind of you as, you know, we're, a lot of us here are, are, are related, to, you know, we're related to a business school or a school of management. And so, you know, you're as CFO, I mean, clearly some of this take, involves financial trade-offs. And, mm -hmm. and so what, what are the business decisions and the operational decisions that have to, be made, and are there, are there challenges in terms of, particularly in your, you know, when you put your financial hat on, uh, to doing some of this? Sure, um, <laughs> there are definitely financial considerations in all of this. Um, I mean, we want to do right by the environment. I mean, that's kind of a leading. Um, a premise that we look at, but we also want to make sure that it is economically viable. Um, and as just a dairy. That has its own set of challenges, um, but the government sets the, the price that you can sell and, and regardless of what the costs are to operate a dairy. So for us, um, it's become really uh, important to selling the cheese and having a value added product because we're able to set the price based on the cost, make sure we're making a profit. It allows us to support a lot of these practices we're doing on the dairy side of the business. Um, so, um, you know, we're looking at kind of payback as well um, and, you know, trying to reduce, like I said, reduce our costs. But um, COVID certainly created a lot of challenges. We were, we were having pretty good steady growth up until, uh, you know, April of 2020, where we saw 45% of our revenue uh, just kind of vanished because we were selling a lot of our cheese to food service and restaurants. and. Um, at the time, we were uh, certainly trying to do anything we could to make sure that we'd be able to survive. And we sold cows and we sold milk and we donated cheese because our cheese was, that was aging was sitting there taking up real estate. We you know, laid off employees and reduced salaries and um, we were fortunate enough that it didn't last as long. We kind of pivoted and we were able to really grow our e-commerce business and get cheese to people directly instead of through the distributor channels. And we saw that e-commerce grow from one to two percent of our sales to you know eight to ten percent by the end of 2020. Um, so we managed to break even. Innovate for good, yes. <laughs> well, we were able to break good, and then 2020, one, everything kind of came back and kind of made up for yeah. that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's certain challenges just operating a dairy in today's world with activists and you know thinking that there's there's a certain group of people that don't want dairies to exist at all and what our premise is i think there's a place and you can do it in a smarter way 
um, and uh, you know continue to try to do good. <laughs> well, I think I can attest that I think that you know we've seen a lot of the even with the logistics challenges of 2021 and 2022, the pivot to e-commerce has been huge. And I, you know, Charles, where are you? You, you know, you need to get your wife a um, hint, hint, <laughs> like uh, Mother's Day is coming up and the cheese boxes are well, amazing. Thanks. So, um, uh, but- Well, I will say for, for people to, um, we also uh, really value education. And that's a lot of it is, you know, people can like cheese, but to understand where your cheese comes from and know your farmer, I mean, that kind of happens a lot. I mean, being here in the Bay Area, a lot of people, you know, will go to farmer's market and whatnot. But we um, did open, um, well, it's about a little over 10 years now um, and went somewhat dormant during COVID, but a culinary and educational center on the farm where we um, will host events and we have uh, cheese tastings. We're just getting ready to open up our cheese tasting a public calendar for the summer. And it's a great way to, you know, come and get more educated about what's going on. Um, you know, we haven't yet brought back tours, but we were doing a lot of walking tours where we would show people, you know, how the digester works and um, all that goes into taking care of the cows and feeding the cows. Um, but it is certainly something that I think helps people to really understand what's going on um, on on uh, farms and, and agriculture in general. It's it's still, you know, I think a really vital, important part yeah. of the uh, industry. I mean, it, it's the important to where, know where your food comes from. And yep. I think that's a part of, of, of uh, the Bay Area culture and it's becoming more pervasive. But maybe we can, you talked a lot about people. And I think a lot of what, when we talk about innovate for good, it's not just, and when we talk about the environment, environmental sustainability, it's not just, uh, uh, ecological it's also social and mm -hmm. so you you said you you know you you had some challenges with layoffs and you've had some challenges so and we we have heard a lot about labor challenges over mm -hmm. the last year and so you know how have you dealt a dealt with some of those challenges but the challenges of dealing with your people in the pandemic mm -hmm. um well, uh, yeah, as I said, the pandemic was was difficult. It was really hard for us to make the decisions we needed to make um, as far as laying off people and even approaching, you know, our um, our staff and mainly managers to say, hey, we also are going to need to reduce salaries and we want you to work harder. I, it's just, you know, kind of hard, but I, I feel like we certainly have people who are really committed to what we do and the the product that we have built in the, the brand. And, you know, we're willing to kind of stick with us. Um, and I think saw that, you know, my sisters and I were right there alongside of them um, and really kind of went into crisis mode um, pretty quickly. Um, I think that being women, uh, owners and leaders, um, it we tend to probably be a little bit more empathetic um, uh, and dealing with families. We all have families um, ourselves, and you know, having to balance all of that as well. And and one thing that we were able to do once we realized we were going to get through this, and we were starting to see the business come together in a different way. Um, we reached out, we rehired anyone who wanted to come back and work for us. We rehired them. All the people that we reduced their salaries, we made them whole. And we went back and retroactively um, uh, paid them. And we've continued to increase our staff. I mean, since then, I mean, like you said, it's just, it's really difficult to, um, to hire people in today's market. And we have the added challenge of having offices. Um, we have some in Petaluma, but in Point Reyes, which that doesn't always work for everyone, but we've been able to be flexible, certainly during COVID as everyone else has too, yeah. with allowing more people to work remotely. But for the most part, our employees want to come to work. I mean, you know, you look at that, that's what you're, that's the commute <laughs> you're driving by every day. And we, um, you know, we, we pay in cheese. We, everybody gets a, a really good cheese allotment. Um, <laughs> uh, and you know, there's other benefits as well, but you know, we're also hiring. So if anyone does want to come work on a dairy farm, well, we've got several positions open, but I think that's just the challenge yeah. of anyone out there. I think, I think there's there. a couple people in the, that the audience from Wisconsin, <laughs> they may, they may take you up on that. <laughs> um, so 
I mean, it's really fascinating. And um, I did want to rewind because it's interesting. We talked about, um, you're talking about how you treat your people well. And one of the things that's been really, um, a lot of discussion about at the University of San Francisco has been um, kind of animal welfare and animal husbandry and really taking care. And, and our president really is focused on kind of the spirits of animals, and which is really kind of a re really interesting and radical mm -hmm. way to think about uh, treating animals with dignity and nature with dignity and it's very consistent with the Pope and his, his thing. So no, where, no, wherever you stand, there is this, <laughs> this interesting dialogue about treating animals just the way, similar to the way we treat people. And um, one thing really struck me when I visited this <laughs> is, is your robotic milkers <laughs> that gave massages to the cows mm. before. Mm -hmm. And so if you haven't seen this, go, go to the web and Google the robotic milkers. <laughs> I'm an autonomous vehicles guy and these autonomous robotic milkers <laughs> are just incredible and you must check them out. Um, but you know, Diana, maybe you can take about what, what's the thinking behind that? I mean, like that innovation right there. Right. Um, Yes, we do focus on cow comfort, we call it, um, because the happier the cows are, the more milk they're gonna produce. It's just been proven that that is the case. So um, we did start looking into the robots uh, uh, several years ago, um, probably initially thinking of it more as a labor savings because milking cows is a 24 seven job and someone's got to get up in the middle of the night and, uh, and milk those cows. And you're relying on that um, human touch for um, cleanliness and you know, uh, making sure that you know, they're really watching you know, the cows as they come in and out of the barn. And so started really kind of researching it. And it took a, a few years, because again, like you talk with other things, it's not an inexpensive thing to, to bring in robots. Um, but we made the decision to move forward with it, and we have eight milking robots. They each milk about um, 60 cows. Um, but what it did was it really shifts the, the, um, the responsibility, if you will, of milking from the, the people on the farm working to the cows. And you have to train them. There's this whole process, which is crazy the first week, to watch these cows kind of train themselves on, on how to use the robots. But then once they, you know, within a couple of days, they, they get used to it. And so um, there's, there is a, a lure, so there's feed in there um, as well, but they come in and the robot will clean their udders, applies um, kind of a, uh, some med medicine afterwards, and um, there's lasers that kind of attach to the teeth so that, that the, the, it's fully automated where they're, they're clamping on and, they're, um, and you get so much more data too. So it's also testing the, the milk. Um, so everything kind of keeps cleaner. They can come, they're somewhat locked out for a few hours, but they can in essence, you know, come in and milk when they want. So we've gone from milking set times every day, two times a day, to on average, um, I think it's about 2.7, 2.8 times a day. So we're actually getting more milk production out of less cows. Um, so it's about 10 to 12% um, uh, overall in terms of the additional milk production that we're getting, which is just means that we have more of our own milk that can go into our cheese rather than purchasing milk from, from someone else. Um, and then there was there's these other cool t toys like Billy was talking about where we've got these like massage, um, uh, uh, oh, to be a cow. Things Wonder around it. the farm. <laughs> well, they often will, will go and, and want to rub against a signpost or a thing. So this way they have uh, uh, this massaging brush that, that they can walk up to and, and get the cow comfort yeah, that way. Yeah, you said something when we, were, when we were talking before, which is a bit, you know, treating animals well so they treat us well. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really good way to uh, can kind of encapsulate that philosophy. And it sounds like that in terms of how you innovate and run your business, that is pervasive. Mm -hmm. So um, I have one last question for you, sure. which is probably the most um, personal, yet, yet I think is probably the most important for all the young women in the audience is that mm -hmm. what, what is the most important thing for you as a woman leader in, in a business and, and particularly in a business run by all women? And you know, what advice would you have for the folks in the audience that, that are aspiring or established women, women leaders that are mm -hmm. career switching, career advancing, that, that want to 
innovate for good, that want to do well and advance in their career. Right. Um, well, I'll say f for me, I didn't quite mention them. I sort of did, but um, you know, ha doing this alongside my sisters um, has been very rewarding, and I couldn't do it without them. I mean, we each, you know, bring different things to the business that really help us as a as a whole to to um, have the checks and balances with each other too. Because I think we all are similar in the mindset of wanting to do good, but sometimes it takes you know someone else. So. Um, just to give a shout out to uh, Lynn and Jill, my two co-partners um, in the business. Um, but, you know, I, I look back to my career in uh, finance and you're continually climbing the ladder. And um, there's always that next promotion, that next job, you know, making more money, um, but, uh, and, and working, I got to a point where just kind of working um, uh, unsustainable hours and not feeling like you're really, you know, doing good. And so um, it came at a good time in my life where I was able to make that shift. And I think I'd gotten to a point where I just didn't really care so much about those other things. Um, but the opportunity to work with my family um, was very important to me. And you know, even in the beginning of going back to the farm, I may be straying off the answer here a little bit, but going back where um, not only with my sisters, but I was able to work alongside my parents and spending more time with them. Um, as it turned out, my, my mom passed away a couple of years later. And so I would have never been able to have that kind of time with them uh, if I hadn't done this. And I do not ever and will never regret making that. And it just makes me, you know, also feel proud of what we've been able to do with the practices. My parents really started a lot of it, and my dad was very innovative and looked to do all kinds of things. But I think even what my sisters and I have been able to do is take it to that next level um, and always trying to push ourselves to do more and give back. Um, you know, we've also been very involved there's there's the running of the business there's being knee deep too much uh in the business working on the business and giving back to the community um and so we've you know been fortunate enough to have great people working for us that allow us to serve on other boards um and whatnot i haven't even talked about yeah the uh, uh marine agricultural land trust which is something i'm really proud to be um, a board member on and we've have uh, uh, our property, we sold the easement um, on our property that will keep our land in agriculture for perpetuity. So it's just something that also kind of gives back to the, the community as well. I think did I answer the question? Answer. I don't know that so, I did. Uh, uh, it's very clear that you have a lot of compassion as well as empathy and, and that spills over to your employees and to your how you articulate what you do. So thank you so much for sharing. Sure. Thank you for being here. And thank you, uh, Diana provided us with a little cheese for the day. So thank you so much for that. And let's sure. give Diana a, a hand. And uh, we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, as we move on, we're going to dive even deeper into this topic, and, and we, we're going to invite up a, a panel next uh, that's going to talk to us and we can see that they're gonna to talk to us a little bit more about like in a granular fashion about uh, how can we innovate in this space? Uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, in the energy space, in the uh, farms, like in the you know a fleet to farm program, in a lighting program, how can we actually optimize systems in a highly granular way? And so, uh, you know, just tearing off of this first presentation, we've heard somebody that's dealing with challenges, that's running a, green, a, a very green business. We're gonna write out, invite up some other speakers. And for, I'm gonna invite up first uh, Yasmin Eichmann, uh, who's the former CEO of Nest and uh, at Google. A and she will uh, maybe invite up our other speakers. Does that sound good? Yes? All right, so uh, I think, uh, yes. Oh, you need a minute. Okay, so let's. Uh, we're gonna take a sec. I thought you. I th All right. We're, so we're gonna do a little switcheroo on the chairs. Um, yeah, as if you want to come up and, and introduce yourself while we're doing this little switch switcheroo. Sure. Um, um. <laughs> All right. Great. So thanks, Billy. I don't think I'll need that. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so as, as Billy mentioned, I'm Yasmeen um, Eichmann Data, and I am in the middle of a transition. I have just left uh, Google after almost 20 years, um, and my latest stint was working on uh, a new product that we've launched la at the end of last year, which is Nest Renew, um, working in the demand response space. So um, have been all over Google, um, at Google X, and, and um, working on a lot of different things over the years, but one of the most rewarding was really getting up to speed in the energy space. And so um, really excited to get to be uh, moderating this panel. So I'm gonna actually ask you guys to come and have a seat, and then I'll probably just ask you to introduce yourselves. Um, do we each have a seat? So yeah, I think we each everyone. Allie, do you wanna sit here? Sure. And then we're, we're in the same order. <laughs> Oh, you're so observant. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of that. Thank you. Okay. We're making it difficult for <laughs> each All right, so I will go ahead and um, get started. As we said, so um, I am relatively new to the energy space. You've got folks on the stage here who've been doing this their entire career, so it's an absolute honor to get to be facilitating this discussion. Um, and I'm gonna start off by just asking each of you panelists to introduce yourselves, tell us about your company, your role at that company, um, and anything else that you'd like to share with the audience. So why don't we start there, Ali? All right, great, thanks Yasmeen. Um, hi everyone, thanks for joining today. I'm Ali DiTrio, I'm the Chief Strategist for Reimagine Power, and we are a boutique uh, microgrid and clean tech consulting firm uh, focused on policy, government regulatory affairs, and market strategy, mostly here in the West, but we do have operations in other states as well. Um, so it's really a pleasure to be here and talk with you all. Um, I've been in the energy industry for about 15 years, holding a variety of different positions in policy, business development, market research. Um, and in 2019, decided to start Reimagine Power to really focus on the niche of microgrid policy and really evolving our energy markets and our clean energy infrastructure for the 21st century. Um, so we have a team of five, uh, and really I focus on leading our diverse portfolio of clients and projects. And we have a you know a small niche. And uh, talking before, we are also a small family business, so I'm really proud of that. That my brother and sister both work for me, um, and we have some other team members as well. They're basically like family to us. So it's been a really great honor and privilege to have a business and continue to work in San Francisco and beyond. Um, so yeah, I think that's it for now. <laughs> great. Yeah, and I'm, I'm Kate Reimer. Um, I have also been in energy and clean tech basically my whole career. Um, started out at PG&E, and then I've been at a series of startups since then doing utility scale, uh, batteries, behind the meter batteries, response. and now I work at Reactive as a VP of technology, um, where we implement energy efficiency, HVAC, and solar solutions for large commercial and industrial clients. Um, and I mean, in my spare time, I'm always trying to get outside and be outdoors, as I'm sure many people who are environmentalists are. And so I love going camping. I just got back from a camping trip last weekend with my son. <laughs> That's great. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Robert Grant. I'm the Senior Vice President of Governor Affairs and Social Impact at Cruise. Cruise is an all-electric, self-driving uh, company here, headquartered here in San Francisco. Hopefully you've seen our cars out in the road and had a pleasant experience with them. Um, we're excited to be here. I wanna thank Billy Riggs and the University of San Francisco for, for hosting this event. It's the, I think, the second or third time that we've been here as Cruise. We're, we're just really excited about that. Um, you know, for me, uh, a, a little of my history, uh, worked in the federal government for a long time, has now been involved with uh, startups and tech and policy world for the last 10 years. Um, and what drew me to Cruise was the fact that we're all electric, we're renewable, this is all intentional, intentional on our part, all of our vehicles, future and present are designed to be shared, uh, and we're really aimed at trying to decarbonize our transportation system, help California uh, reach its GHG goals, and then um, moving forward as we scale, we really think we can have a large impact on not only how people move, hopefully move sustainably, um, but also uh, on how charging rolls out in this city and otherwise, because uh, that's one of our big challenges. Cool. Great. Hey everyone, my name is Peter Light, and delighted to be here today. Uh, San Francisco resident, uh, though grew up in the mountains of Colorado, and uh, there I really developed just a passion for uh, 
decarbonizing our energy system globally as the world goes from six to nine billion people in the early 2000s, I had the good fortune of you know, uh, leaving college to go work at a place called the Rocky Mountain Institute. And um, I just got, I fell in love with the energy system, the transportation system, um, and I just saw this kind of underlies our lives. And yet there was this ability, this potential to go um, serve people energy in a ways that serve their lives, but do so in a way that didn't impact our planet. Um, and that was just the grand challenge I wanted to dedicate myself to. Um, I was at a company called Bloom Energy uh, that started out in a lab with NASA scientists and you know, is now, um, it provides on-site clean energy generation to many um, large businesses. And later at Google X, um, where I co-founded a program that really went to model the whole power grid to say, how do you get to a deeply decarbonized grid? And there I started to see, wow, there, there are all these commercial buildings that could save money with on-site clean energy and they're not doing it. So why is that? Um, went to talk to a bunch of building owners and that led to what is now Lumen Energy, when I'm the co-founder and CEO. Um, we're a young company growing here in San Francisco. Uh, and we are really out to make it super easy for commercial building owners to profitably decarbonize. So. Great, thank you. Um, and so before we dig in deeper, I wanna take a minute and also take your pulse on where you stand on sort of climate pessimism and optimism. And the reason I ask is because, as I mentioned, I'm uh, left big tech with this intention of really digging into climate and, and figuring out where I can have the most impact. And um, depending on, I find myself fluctuating between utter despair <laughs> to you know, deep optimism, um, depending on what I'm reading or who I'm talking to, and that fluctuation can happen within the span of an hour, um, depending. So I'm really curious, um, you know, for those of you who've been you know, in this for such a long time and living and breathing this day in, day out, where would you say you are on that spectrum right now? You wanna start with me? Yeah. We can go off, why don't mm -hmm. we start with Peter? <laughs> I'm an optimist and I will, I will not understand that it, it is a massive challenge to move how we power our lives um, and uh, how we shift. You know, if you look at the history of industrial transformations, um, there, there are things that happen, but they happen slowly. We're talking about shifting how we move people, how we live. Um, and yet where I'm deeply optimistic, um, I think, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, an author that, that I looked to that, that really captured it best. It was a guy named Ramez Nam. He put it in his book called The Infinite Resource. It's called The Power of Ideas on a Finite Planet. And I thought that really just captured that where, you know, resources are, are finite, but, but ideas are not, they're infinite. And I think our ability as a society and a community to compound the benefits that we get when we advance technologies and policies and ways of collaborating, that's what I see happening. And I, I've seen it happen now in the last like 18 months. It is amazing to see the inrush of talent into this space and you know, all the companies here and, and, and beyond. Um, so it's the, the inflow of talent and ideas and capital to support those ideas is just phenomenal. So that is something I'm very excited about. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Yeah, for, for those that, that have had the chance to know me or just getting to know me, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist um, <laughs> on, on nearly every issue. So, uh, but on this one in particular, I, I do think, um, to Peter's point, uh, the, the innovation, the creativity, the, the ability to solve solutions, even though there are challenges with that, I always place my bet on, on society and people to move in the right direction. Uh, it might be slow, it may not be as fast as we want, but, but uh, you know, the arc of our story uh, tends towards uh, greater benefits and to addressing bigger issues. And so I, I really do think we're on that path. I think it's accelerating to Peter's um, statement. And, and I'm thinking, you know, we have somebody or two former panelists and this panelist who work with their families. They must be optimists because I know my family um, and I, I'm not sure I'd get into business with them. So <laughs> uh, I think there has to be some optimism uh, uh, from those folks. <laughs> I admire that. <laughs> I feel as though um, we are probably not doing enough fast enough, and I have seen a lot of people join clean tech and leave clean tech. 
So that's really hard for me. <laughs> I also have a four-year-old son who's going to be really impacted by this, and it's really hard for me to imagine what that conversation is going to be like when it happens. Um, you know, those things said, though, in the middle of the day in California, we're like 75% or more renewables right now. Yay, yeah. California! Woo! <laughs> Um, so that's that's awesome, you know, um, and I love seeing like all the vehicle electrification that's happening. It seems like I live in Berkeley. It's happening everywhere. <laughs> like every new car is an EV. Um, so those things are all really encouraging to me and I would never want to work in another industry. Yeah, I'd say I waver between um, healthy skepticism and optimism. Uh, sometimes it's easy to get caught up in jaded by the politics and feel like, you know, there's a lot of different stakeholders that all want different things. And it's really hard to um, build consensus and move forward on especially a lot of these bigger policy decisions. And so sometimes I do feel, you know, a, a little bit of pessimism. But I think I really always come back to the optimism when I see just the youth and the new generations that are coming up and you know graduating college at this time or that are in school, there's a lot more awareness, I feel like, in climate and sustainability than there ever was before. Um, I was an ASU grad, um, went to the School of Sustainability, and was one of the first to ever get an actual real degree in sustainability. And at the time, we were just, you know, they were throwing things at the wall and seeing what stuck with, you know, sustainability of economics and, you know, urban planning and environment. Now they have a full school with multiple majors built out over the years, and so many other schools have followed, which, which is really great. So I think the education, the awareness has really come a long way, as well as the technology. So I remain really optimistic that our future generations are really going to help us solve these problems. Yeah. Well, you guys are making me feel more optimistic and more hopeful, <laughs> so I guess that's good. Um, I think there's also the role, like you said, of just holding the accountability, mm -hmm. um, too, of making sure that we're um, eyes wide open on what needs to be done and how far away we are from that, <laughs> where we're going. And on that note, um, I'd love to hear from each of you what your companies are doing and what the work that you're doing inside of your companies. When we talk about what we can do and should be doing, um, in this uh, in this fight, what are you doing? Um, what are your companies doing to pivot to clean energy? How are they thinking about climate? Um, and I want to ask if it's enough. Yeah. Do you want to start, Peter? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so uh, a, a couple thoughts. Something that uh, I, I mean, let's let's also like look just the scale of the problem. I don't want to understate it. It is a massive, massive challenge. And, and also, if you sort of look at the IPCC reports of just talk about, you know, this this year, the, it needs to be the last year of, of emissions this high. It needs to trend down radically by 2030. And you just look across the complexity of our energy and climate and carbon system. Uh, it's really hard. I think, though, What's really exciting is that there are technologies that make sense, and I think these issues get more and more about deployment and business models, and I think that, that is a, there's a lot of talent outside of this room and outside of, call it like, the believer class. And I'll just give you a live example of that. Um, last night I was on a phone with um, the chief investment officer of a large uh, real estate company who is saying, look, we want to green all of our buildings, and we're doing that to get all of our, t like, we want to get the best tenants yeah. want this now. So that's, that is, to, in my mind, those are um, those are forces that are that are um, very significant and move sort of way beyond. So, um, I think to your question, like, what are we doing? I mean, that that's maybe sort of gives you a hint that what we have found is that um, there are many buildings, uh, commercial buildings, which could save money with on-site clean energy, and and there are some that want to fully decarbonize. But the process to do that has been bewildering and complicated, and people don't do it. Um, there's all kinds of challenging data issues. Um, there, are, it's a, it's an it's a complex undertaking to go figure it out. Um, so we show up. We've we've designed software to remotely price and model buildings to give people an instant answer as to whether your building has potential. And then we guide people through the process through a supplier marketplace to help them um, get the best value through the process. So snapshot. Great. Um, yeah. So at Cruise, I mean, I think a couple of things that we're doing. One, we're challenging the industry to be all electric. Um, and so last year, we worked with the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, labor unions, and others uh, to pass a bill in Sacramento that requires all light-duty AVs to be EVs 
by 2030. This is five years ahead of where the Newsom administration had hoped all vehicle sales would be. Um, so one, we're leading by example in the policy realm. Two, we're leading by example in kind of the infrastructure. So uh, just down at the San Francisco waterfront on Cesar Chavez Street, uh, we plan to build one of the largest charging stations in all of North America. Mm -hmm. uh, to Peter's point, even in San Francisco, uh, there's a lot of hurdles and kind of um, unique things that you have to go through. So I think just to put that in perspective, we've had to have seven different agencies sign off on this uh, infrastructure project. We've gotten six of them so far. Uh, and then that's just the beginning of the end of the beginning uh, to, <laughs> to move this project forward. Um, so, uh, but we are putting our money where our mouth is in terms of building that infrastructure. And then thirdly, how are we sourcing that uh, electricity? Well, we have a, an innovative project that, that Billy has mentioned called Farm to Fleet, where we're uh, sourcing all of our uh, power from the Central Valley, uh, buying RECs uh, through the LCFS system uh, from two uh, family-owned farms in the Central Valley, uh, Moonlight Farms and, and Sundale Farms. Um, and so this is a way that, that we can actually tie tech and agriculture together here in California. We think it can be a national model for how rural and urban um, uh, uh, economies can meet, uh, even though uh, autonomy may or may not be front and center in a lot of uh, rural areas. Uh, and then lastly, I would say, you know, one of the things we're doing is trying to really be out in the community and advocate for use of sustainable transportation. So we have uh, just signed a recent kind of early rider pilot with the University of San Francisco. Mm. Uh, and so the students here uh, are the first in the world to really experience fully driverless rides in a all electric, all renewable uh, <laughs> autonomous vehicle. And they're giving us great feedback. Uh, so one of the things our early riders have told us is 81% say they will take into account whether their ride is zero emission or not. Mm. Uh, so that also kind of feeds my optimism. Yeah. So a lot going on on our end. Can we do more? I always think we can do more. My team knows this, my people yeah. know this. Yeah. Uh, I challenge us to do more because there's more to be done. Yeah, but I love that you're thinking about the model and thinking about how to scale those models, whether it be yeah. kind of urban rural, that type of thing, or taking the model that you have and how do we supercharge that, right? And what are the opportunities to, and we'll talk a little bit about cross sector later, but what are the opportunities to um, partner and collaborate to just take something that's working in one city, in one state and Awesome. Yeah. yeah, well, and speaking of speed, yeah. <laughs> um, at Redaptive, you know, one of the really major selling points that we have for our customers is that we're going to give, you know, these Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 clients with large portfolios of building a faster path to net zero, right? I mean, that's such an important part of what we're trying to achieve here. And um, so we've been really encouraged by the number of clients who've been coming to us lately because of, for instance, like the changes in the, the SEC carbon disclosure rules. These are all really fantastic policies that are coming into place to help us as an industry. Um, do you want to talk real quick about this SEC disclosure and just give oh, us yeah, folks that aren't sure, aware? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, just recently, um, there were some announcements that SEC will be requiring uh, public companies to disclose the amount of carbon that they're emitting and to have targets um, for sort of, you know, uh, sustainability targets and goals. It's not necessarily uh, maybe as aggressive as uh, some really hardcore envi environmentalists would want it to be in the sense that it could actually be mandating net zero, and it, we're not quite there yet, but we're certainly making progress, and that's really exciting. Um, so yeah, I mean, our sort of, some of the innovations that we would love to sort of bring to the market here are to really show that full path to net zero, bringing together energy efficiency, HVAC, solar technologies, all to, to sort of these, these really large, um, in some cases like retail banking, manufacturing, large CNI customers who've not necessarily made this their top priority historically mm -hmm. uh, and making it a double bottom line issue. Um, yeah, so I, I think speed is, is one of the things we're really trying to accomplish because we don't have that much time. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, so Reimagine Power is, as the name says, reimagining the power sector, and we work with a lot of different clients to help them achieve those goals and really looking at energy market evolution, I would say, for the 21st century, how we can you know, deploy more clean energy projects in a strategic manner, how we can modernize our electric grid for the future so we can have all these autonomous vehicles, you know, a lot more of the electric vehicle and you know, other distributed energy resources that people and companies are all starting to adopt and make sure 
sure that our grid is re ready and able to handle that. So we do a lot of boots on the ground advocacy for our clients. And so we're in Sacramento, we're at the Public Utilities Commission, and we're really trying to bring that voice of, you know, making sure that we're moving faster, but also doing it in a strategic manner. And so a lot of the things that we really focus on is, you know, reimagining the power sector and provide um, so that we have a diverse portfolio of clean energy solutions. And so I was really heartened to see the, um, the discussion earlier about bioenergy because I think it's also a really important um, energy resource that's not talked about very much, but it provides the clean, firm power resources that we really need to complement all the solar production and other renewables that are intermittent, like wind, um, that have um, come to dominate our energy portfolio here in California, which is great. So we're also trying to advise our clients and help them, you know, as they figure out what are we, what are we, what is our role in the 21st century power system? And so we do work with a lot of the uh, startups and nonprofits that are looking at these issues very closely. So really excited about all that's happening in the future and just trying to help them navigate the policy and regulatory spaces that can be very uh, convoluted and difficult, especially when these companies are really just focusing on how do we innovate and how do we bring our products to market. So we really help them with navigating the policy space that they can focus on innovating more for good. Mm -hmm. So awesome. I think taking, um, taking that thread of innovating um, and innovation in this space. I mean, there's a lot of technology that exists. There's a lot of tools that exist, mm -hmm. um, whether it be microgrids, PPAs, direct response, EVs, and all the technology that's coming there. I'm curious, shifting to this, to talking about specific technologies. Um, what? First of all, I want to know. If, I want. I want your thoughts on: Are they the right ones? Do we have the right technologies? Um, and secondly. What technologies do you feel will be the most impactful as we look at the issues in front of us and, and moving to net zero? So let's start with you, Peter. Sure. Um, well, uh, you know, there's, uh, if there's a specific channel of energy Twitter where people have had this debate for a long time, if you've all seen this, they're like, we don't have enough. There's kind of the Stereotypes are like brought like the Bill Gates camp of just like we're not there, can't run Tokyo on solar panels, therefore we need to like fresh start. And then there's more of like, hey, we've got all the stuff. Jigger Shaw, you know, he's the uh, Department of Energy now, so like we've got everything we need. We just need to mobilize it quickly and at scale and hundreds of billions of dollars, and we're open to go do that. Um, I personally, um, having sort of worked in frontier clean energy technologies, I, I guess my own journey has been like in 2017 or 18. I thought, you know, where I want to spend my time is actually in the like mass deployment of the stuff that we already know works and is cost effective. And we're like, we're just at the starting line of that as much as in my universe, like even solar and batteries, like, oh yeah, that's all been done. Like, nope. 3% of buildings in the US have on-site clean energy. Many, many of them could. And that's, that's the kind of thing that I think is, that has really high potential to me. I think what's gonna happen over time is there are gonna be things, well, like, you know, it used to be oh, natural gas, like you can't get rid of it in a building. Um, that's just unimaginable for a heat. And then people are like, well, wait, like what? Like there's a heat pump and we, you know, this has been tried a few times and then now those are kind of rolling out and then there are cities that are saying you can't use gas anymore. So there, those things are just, there's the cascade of new technologies that are coming. There's also tremendous innovation in, in storage technologies. You might think of batteries in a car just as one, but there's all sorts of, sorts of other long duration, non lithium ion technologies. So that, that sort of, um, I call just sort of vast speciation of technologies as happening behind the scenes, which is really cool to see. And then there are you know, a variety of companies which are gonna help people just sort of get them to market. Um, the one other thing I'll say, like, do we have what we need? And, and, and this kind of brings it full circle. Um, just yesterday, a friend of mine um, runs a company that um, is making a novel carbon-free uh, carbon cement. They just raised a $55 million Series A um, through, yeah, in one investor was Bill Gates' uh, you know, Breakthrough Energy Ventures. I just highlight that. A novel cement technology for most of the last 15 or 20 years, I don't think you could, that would be just like, good luck kids, you know, enjoy yeah. your science project. Now those yeah. things are getting massive funding and that's really great to see. So there's a, there's a whole spectrum of, of kind of the, you know, TRL, if you will, or technology readiness are things that are still very much in the lab, but there's a lot more that's happening. And so 
long answer, yes, we have the technology in various stages, but yeah. um, there's still a lot to, lot to go yeah. change and make happen. And I'm hearing you speak to innovation and deployment. Yes. And it sounds like you're you're in both camps. I'm like yes, yes, and yes, we need it all. Well, yes, we need we. I mean, the, the 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 cold math is yes, we need it all. We needed it yesterday. You know, we have just enough time starting now. But I think the the question of like, do we need? I you know, I think in language we can just get these like binaries. Like we either yeah. have it or we don't. And I don't think it's quite that way. Um, I, the thing maybe I'll just leave you with, though, is that like the, the opportunities for deploying things that already work and already cost effective is still so vast and untapped. Great. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll say it kind of simply because people a lot smarter than me on, on this panel have been doing this a lot easier. Uh, I, I think of it in terms of convenience. Right, I, I, I don't look at a lot of people and they say, you know, how can I really screw up the environment more today, right? That's not like on the first thing. They're just like, I gotta live my life, I gotta do things. I gotta get from point A to point B, I've gotta buy X, or I gotta, I'm building a building, you know? Um, so it's really about, to me, access and deployment at scale, right? And so uh, we see this with charging infrastructure. I think if available, you know, and people have an opportunity to get away uh, around, you know, I'm a transportation person, so I'll stay in that my realm. Um, you know, they'll choose that option if it's available to them. And, and what we're trying to do at Cruise is say, hey, you know, you don't even have to buy an electric vehicle, right? You don't have to find a place to charge it. You don't have to worry about those concerns. We'll take that on, that's our burden, and we'll make something available to you that's convenient, that's easy to use. Mm -hmm. You do that for most people, I think it's easy for them to make that choice yeah, then, to be fun. more sustainable, to, to think about climate uh, in a way that's convenient, but you have to make it easy for them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like with the cement, if there's an available substitute that's not extraordinarily yeah. expensive, I imagine people are gonna eat that up, right? Yeah. Um, but it's it, it, getting to scale is kind of the hardest thing here. Um, and then getting people to realize that this is convenient and can be part of their everyday life and we're not asking them to become an environmental activist to help save the environment, yeah. uh, they'll make those choices. Yeah, and you're seeing the inflow of capital to help get to scale. Yeah. And then we'll talk next about policy and existing structures and, and where we are there, but I, that is yeah. heartening. And I, yeah, that's great to hear, Kate. Yeah, I mean, so one one gap that we see in sort of the innovation space is going to sound probably pretty pretty boring. <laughs> uh, I'll start out with that. It's a good intro, I know. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, we what we've seen is a lot of customers, including um, like REITs and other sort of like landlords, who actually cannot get access to bills. Just plain basic information that would go into these SEC type disclosures that say, mm -hmm. this is how much energy we're consuming. They just don't even have access to that basic information across their entire fleet. It's actually remarkably difficult to gather. And we, for instance, have developed a meter that we ship out and install at facilities to ensure that we can actually gather this information more reliably. Turns out that's easier than going to the utility companies. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, there is sort of this really interesting space for innovation, even in just gathering data and sort of the back end stuff that seems like it should probably already be in place. Um, big shout out to Utility API because they've also been working on this problem for a long time and they've made a lot of progress, especially across the solar states. But there's 3,000 utilities across this country. So it's a, it's a pretty daunting challenge if you're really trying to hit a whole portfolio like we are um, and something that we've been thinking deeply about. Um, it's a kind of a different form of innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think one thing that I think about with technology is how we can have it achieve multiple goals. Um, and one technology that I really work a lot on, but I think is really cool, is microgrids, which are a combination of a many different technologies, both generating and storage resources, and they're interconnected to form through a discrete geographic area, and they have the ability to island or disconnect from the utility grid and operate autonomously. And microgrids can serve a variety of different roles. They're not just for backup power, though that's a chief one. And as we've seen in California in particular, you know, we've had lots of wildfires and blackouts and other you know, natural disasters or extreme weather that really um, strain the grid and either can um, result in people getting blacked out for several days or maybe even a week at a time in some of the rural areas, or even just having poor power quality, which for a lot of these high tech applications really rely on you know, very reliable source of energy as needed. Um, so I think that there's a, a way of really 
you know, investing in the technologies that are going to solve multiple problems. And so with microgrids, you know, they can also provide a tool, I think, for communities to both save energy, save money on their utility bills, and optimize their energy needs, but also in times of need would actually be able to keep that power running um, during times of disruption otherwise, which is a really great thing for the communities, especially with critical facilities and other public agencies that have, you know, life or death operations that need to keep running. Um, so they think those are really important uh, to keep investing in. And so if we can think about the technologies from serving multiple purposes and really help on, you know, provide a truly sustainable solution, I think that's a really important thing to consider for the technology as it keeps evolving over time. Mm -hmm. So let's stick with that as we think about microgrid uh, technology. So we're talking about the technology. In general, there's a lot of technology, right? And, and more coming that we need. Um, I'm curious your thoughts, particularly because you're focusing in policy, your boots on the ground. Um, what are, so structurally, what are the changes that we need to see, right? We talk, in terms of policy adoption, policy changes, um, our economic, what are the, what are the barriers um, to getting some of these technologies deployed at scale, right? And that's really what's gonna make an impact and move the needle. So curious where, what your thoughts are there. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd say one of the biggest challenges for microgrids, and I would say this also comes down to, you know, distributed energy resources of all sizes, as we have a legacy utility business model um, where, you know, we built our grid, you know, in the 20th century, even some in the 19th century, um, you know, based on the fact that we're having large, you know, centralized power sources, you know, transmitting power over long distance transmission lines to the end use customer, who is really a passive customer, you know, they pay their bills, they expect their lights to come on. And that's, that's about the extent of that exchange. Now, as we're coming into the 21st century, we have a lot of customers that are demanding more innovative technological solutions. They want to take control of their own energy needs. And I think they're really being stymied by this kind of legacy business model that has persisted from the 20th century. And a lot of our policies and regulations really have not caught up uh, to where the technology is, or I think really reacting to the sense of urgency with climate change and moving faster because we really need to. Our regulators tend to be very risk averse, and so they are naturally hesitant um, to want to invest in new technologies or, you know, let other companies and other market actors kind of enter the space and provide these innovative solutions. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a real challenge with our, our legacy utility business model and how we invest in the grid and who should be allowed to invest in the grid. So I think some of the changes we need to make are you know, letting more customers and communities form their own energy um, microgrid, like a community level microgrid, and make sure that they're allowed to do that so long as they're meeting, you know, safety and reliability metrics, which are, are key and make sure that everyone is protected in the public. So I think that's one critical piece of the puzzle. And also providing monetization pathways for things like microgrids to provide grid services, demand response, and other, uh, I would say, things that help the grid in general during blue sky conditions. So we're not just investing in these assets for an emergency or black sky conditions, mm -hmm. but they can provide value back to the grid and utilities um, in normal operations. So I think that's really important. That allows us to really, I would say, monetize resiliency mm -hmm. so we have, you know, these, these projects, and these assets are providing uh, benefits all the time. And then when we really need them for the emergencies, they're also there, but we didn't have to invest in something just for an emergency. Mm -hmm. oh, that Kate. I mean, yeah. I mean, in terms of structural things, I, I mean, I was referring earlier to, I mean, I can't, I, I'm still sort of in awe, frankly, that the SEC <laughs> is interested in our in our greenhouse gas emissions. I, I love that. I think that's a really great, great thing that's happening. But I, I do think that um, there are policies that could be, you know, brought down from the federal level that would, that would make a lot of impact. Um, I am really encouraged by the amount of private um, entities that are moving sort of behind the meter on their own independently. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that there, there really has been this sweep of um, social movements that, um, you know, that, that basically bring people and, and bring customers to a point where they really care about sustainability from the, the, the products that they're, that they're choosing, right? Sort of, mm -hmm. um, you know, buy, uh, voting with your dollars, if you will, mm -hmm. buying sustainable cheese. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I am encouraged by sort of all the movement that's happening on the private side, independent of those regulatory efforts. Yeah. Yeah, you're in all the SEC. I'm still in all the robot milkers. I have to see this. This is, 
<laughs> really cool stuff. Um, for me, I think, you know, you've, you guys have touched upon two other things. So something different I think about is uh, land use policy and tax policy. Mm. Uh, I think these are the types of policies that um, seem really banal and boring, but really can make markets shift consumer decisions, shift investment decisions, um, and, and can really play a very uh, helpful role in, in getting everyday people to move towards a more sustainable future. Um, and so one of the things that, that we talk about at Cruise a lot is that um, there is not a conflict between added density and the housing issue and electrification. Um, and so uh, that's where this issue of like land use policy comes together. Where can you uh, put charging stations? How can you integrate maybe uh, private charging and public charging together as you uh, look towards um, increasing um, a value for, for the land use uh, over time, particularly as the world gets more populated, cities get more dense. Uh, so I think they, they seem kind of boring, but they play a very important role in getting government to have that hand that pushes people mm -hmm. in the right direction. And are you engaging directly with those entities? So, so we are, we of... do. We, we engage at the local, state, federal, international yeah. level uh, on, on all of those issues. Uh, and so I really think, though, it starts with the, that old phrase of, you know, uh, act locally, think globally. Um, and so what we try to do is make San Francisco kind of uh, our our initial efforts here, and mm -hmm. then see where we can scale out from there. Back to model, kind of model. Uh, because if, if anyone's worked in the policy world, San Francisco uh, is is a really good hard place to learn how to solve complex <laughs> problems. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I'll just say I'm, I'm, I've been curious sitting here thinking about what those seven different groups you had to get approvals for. I mean, those are the kind of things mm -hmm. like that. That's a light bulb for where there's a potential for innovation. And I think maybe to the broader comment about just sort of expanding our definition of technology. I mean, Kate hinted at this and we both live and breathe this space. You, we sort of tend to think of like there's some catalyst breakthrough or some, something mm -hmm. that was then in a lab, but like in the world of decarbonizing buildings, it's the things like there are, the critical energy data is locked up in PDFs that are in super antiquated systems and people just can't get the information. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things, there, there's a one strike of the pen which is just mandate that uh, utility data be available from buildings that, you know, with privacy concerns, but all that. But that's, yeah. those are, they're kind of things like that that are, uh, that would be m very catalytic. Yeah, and those are the pieces that unlock the next thing, right? It's the barriers, right? And you're going, okay, if we can make that mandated, then what are all the other possibilities? And back to like innovation or deployment, well, these new structures, it's innovative, right? We need to think differently about data in a context of an entirely different grid, right? And a different reality that we're living in today. Um, so I've just been told we only have a few minutes left, um, and I have two questions for all of you that I wanna hear. So I'm gonna ask both questions um, and give you guys a chance to answer both at the same time time. So one is, you guys have been in this space for a really long time. Um, and as leaders in this space, in the energy space, um, I'd love to hear your advice for individuals, for organizations, for the industry at large. How do we need to be thinking as leaders, every single one of us, everybody in the room, all of us on stage, um, to, to to unlock all, all these pieces, to think innovatively, to to make an impact here on this incredibly difficult problem before us. So that's one. And then we're talking about energy and microgrids, and and you know we're we're talking kind of at a higher level. I'm curious, um, again, as someone who's newer to this space, um, it can be frustrating how much talking there is. And I'm curious about what is it that we can be doing, every single one of us right now, um, to be making a difference here and to start to move the needle and to move the needle faster. Um, so love to get all of your thoughts on both questions. Um, Rob, do you wanna start? Sure, wow, those are, those are big questions. Um, <laughs> and you only have a few minutes. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, so, you know, I think my advice to people would be, um, Take action. Don't don't be afraid to move forward with big ideas uh, and to to not necessarily you know gird for a fight with the establishment, but be prepared to challenge norms. Um, right? We're we're doing this a little bit in the autonomous vehicle industry with all electric vehicles and how we want to get around. Um, you know, 
we're trying to get people to think differently about how they look at their transportation options and what are the rules that go around those new choices. Um, and it, it requires some outside the box thinking. Uh, and so I would always say, um, don't be afraid to challenge kind of norms and assumptions. Uh, I say this to my 16 year old all the time. My wife thinks I'm crazy. Yeah, like, he needs to be man. following the rules. I'm like, well, <laughs> this is the time to like challenge the rules. Yeah. Uh, and so I would say, you know, to everybody kind of do that in ways that you can, uh, big or small. And then, you know, secondly, um, how can we each make a difference every day? Um, it's going to sound kind of weird, and uh, maybe I've been in California too long, but uh, I think it starts with uh, being kind and being open to others and others' thoughts. Um, I think the way you change people's minds and habits is through that connection. Um, I think we can try to have government come down and dictate what we should all do, but I think the most influential people uh, in most people's lives are their friends, their families, their people they work with. And to the extent that we can be open and, and share and, and push uh, gently on kind of moving towards a, a more sustainable future, yeah. I think that's the biggest impact. Yeah, that and that collective awareness by just exactly. being here today and having this discussion. Perfect, yeah. thanks. Peter? Sure, wow. Well, um, just bottle put Rob said that's very well spoken and I, I, I share, the, share the feeling and sentiment, I'd say, um, yeah, just beginning where we are, there's, there's, there's so much to be done. There's something for everyone to contribute just right where you are now. And I think that's like uh, uh, applying yourself in these areas. If it, if it calls to you and it's your passion and curiosity. Um, I think to come back to your first question, I mean, it's something that I always ask myself is really just kind of what, what ceiling, what ceiling am I setting accidentally? And mm. um, you know, I, a little story that I'll share with you all that I, that I love is, and it's inspirational for me, is um, in Yosemite, El Capitan, 3,000 foot rock face. You know, for most of human history, that was looked at as just this beautiful, glorious, but unbelievably big mountain. And then in 1958, this guy named Warren Harding go, ends up climbing it over 45 days and a year and a half of journey and rope and whiskey and, you know, it's just, and it was like this amazing feat. And then people are like, oh, that's possible. And then they said, you know, they, well, maybe we can do it, you know, in a little bit less time. And by the 90s, someone did it in a day. By 2017, a guy named Alex Honnold climbed it in a few hours with no ropes. No ropes, yeah. And there's no technology in that whole story that was, oh, someone, it's, it's possible, it's possible. So that, that compounding of what's possible keeps happening. And I think that's, that's what is super exciting to me. And I just ask myself, you know, again, like, where is there, where is there the glass ceiling that I, you know, might be creating ourselves? Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Okay. And I'll give, yeah, my answer is probably pretty quick. Um, I mean, as a leader, the, the, the thing that I feel myself repeating all the time is like, how do we break down these silos? And I think that applies within companies. It also applies in industry and between policy and different, different groups as well. But, um, the more we can break down silos, the better. And it's especially hard in Zoom land, right? When we're all remote and we're constantly trying to connect through this little portal <laughs> that, we, that we view the world through, mm -hmm. it just becomes harder. And so it has to become more intentional. Uh, communication is an intentional and very tactical thing sometimes. And so we need to just keep pushing to connect and to make sure that we're all kind of communicating and making sure that we're working together to solve this challenge. No one should be trying to face this alone. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, as a leader, I'm always trying to thinking about how do I build alliances with others and really trying to keep an open mind throughout the whole process and not um, box out any solutions, but really, you know, keep all options on the table. But, you know, really try to empathize with others and understand their position, where they're coming from, you know, try to communicate in an honest and intentional way. Um, while again, still, you know, fighting for what we believe in, what we really need to do to solve a lot of these problems. So I think it's a delicate balance, but I'm always thinking about how do I build alliances Alliances. Um, and I would also say, you know, paying it forward, I really think it's critically important that we help and bring up the generations behind us. And, you know, when you think about how you're early on in your career and all the mentors and leaders that may have helped you, I really always try to think about how I can help the future generations as well. So I'm always open to talking with college students. I'll always make time for people. I like hiring younger people so that they, we can all help bring them up together. And so I think it's really crucially important that we pay it forward as well. Well, mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you so much. I mean, you know, sort of the communi empathy, communication, um, kindness, uh, you know, challenging ourselves. Um, I think all really, really, really great advice. Um, and I'm honored to have learned so much from all of you today. Um, it's, you know, if we think about the energy transformation that is ahead of us, it's huge. Um, you guys have been working on it for a really long time. Super grateful um, on behalf of, of all of everyone here. Um, and yeah, thank you for, for sharing that. And I think, again, just being here in community, grappling with these issues, um, I know we're making a difference. I know that we're moving forward. And um, I you know, just want to see us do more and more. So thank you. Thank you for very thoughtful uh, answers to all the questions. Thank you. Thank you all, I really appreciate it. So uh, we're gonna do a little transition here. So thank you all again. Um, we have some gifts for you and they're in the back. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, don't spend it all in one place. So. <laughs> but uh, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. It was such an amazing panel. And I think it really sets us up for what you've seen some of the folks um, entering online. So um, let's give this panel a round of applause again. Um, and so we'll transition to uh, our next segment. We have uh, a, an interesting discussion uh, with an entrepreneur, a 12-year-old sea advocate, as well as a CEO for Aquarium of the Bay. So, um, but before we do that, I just wanted to highlight, we, we, do, we are running this interactive poll. You can see here on both sides of the screen, a lot of you have actually already been participating. Uh, it looks like some of you had been voting early and often, which is okay in this format. Uh, but you can see here that a lot of folks are really talking about ESG. We could probably unpack what that meant. Um, a lot of things that I think we're gonna continue to talk about in this next panel, but also when we get into talking about some finance and structure uh, in uh, our, our panel and uh, our penultimate panel uh, about kind of how we can think about the, the new ways to think about uh, money and finance and structures to address climate sustainability in an innovative way. So uh, without further ado, I want to welcome first to stage uh, alumni of University of San Francisco, John Fisher, uh, CEO of CrowdOptic, as well as VC NFT, uh, and his daughter, Avery Fisher, uh, uh, sea advocate, 12-year-old uh, extraordinaire, came, came today after school. Of course, my boys are back in the back. Uh, they came to watch you and cheer you on, want to hear about everything new. So you come on up. And uh, then uh, also we're, we're really delighted to be joined. Oh, we can do, we can do the fist bump. Fist bump. We can do the fist bump. Right. Yeah, so wait. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, George Jacob from Aquarium uh, of the Bay. Uh, thank you so much for being here, George. I really appreciate it. Um, so uh, uh, maybe we can just sit down and talk about what you all have been up to for the last two years, John, Avery. I mean, that's a good way to start our, our discussion this, this afternoon. Last uh, two years, yeah, it's been crazy. Uh, well, I mean, you want to, so, I got the pleasure of meeting John a few months ago, and I just met Avery today, and it was interesting to hear about what you did when the pandemic uh, happened to all of us. Yeah. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that, or, and maybe, if you wouldn't mind, John, maybe introduce yourself, and Avery, if you wanna introduce yourself as well, to start off here. Go ahead, sweetheart. Um, I'm Avery Fisher, I'm 12 years old, and during the lockdown, I became a um, scuba diver. Uh, to this day, I, and the youngest scuba diver um, for Scuba Magic. And I also am a volunteer at the Aquarium of the Bay and I help take care of animals and um, just witness the environment and stand up for um, the ocean and help people follow their passions involving the ocean. Cool, George. Go ahead, George. Uh, we um, underwent probably the worst period in our 26 year history at the Aquarium with the shutdown. We um, lost, uh, we are a team of 200 people. We lost half our staff in the first uh, one week of shutdown. And we had 24,000 animals to feed and uh, no revenue streams coming in. And uh, three people who stepped up, one would be John. And there was a young boy from Spokane who stepped up with all his pocket money and uh, had this rallying cry that raised uh, you know, over $100,000 for the aquarium. And um, 
uh, young Avery here uh, with her dad, uh, they actually made a significant difference to how the aquarium approaches uh, uh, NFT-based auctions. All right, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves there, Josh. Why don't you just tell us, uh, um, we're going to scratch the service on y what you do, which is, it sounds like a lot. But, um, John, why don't you tell us kind of what, you know, your, your background and, and how you ended up in this situation in the pandemic, diving with your daughter. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an inventor, an entrepreneur. Uh, NASA released a study a, a year before the pandemic hit, and they said that, 20 million Empire State buildings worth of ice broke off from Greenland and fell into the ocean uh, in the 20th century. And that this process is a third of everything responsible, causing planet Earth to literally wobble on its axis as it spins in, in orbit. So we human beings are literally shaking the Earth, right? And uh, you feel that sometimes. You feel that on the way here, traffic, how loud it is, uh, and everything else. And then all of a sudden, the pandemic struck, and there is no traffic, and everything's quiet, except the ocean, at least in, in our lives. And it really called to us uh, in, in, in a different way. And we decided to spend the pandemic uh, in it. And Avery, age 10, learned to scuba dive, which is the minimum age that you're able to do that. But by age 11, she was accomplishing things that uh, in that industry had not been accomplished at that age. I mean, we just tore into this. What an opportunity. And then we couldn't get Avery to warm water to meet all the creatures that she deserved to, to meet. We couldn't get on the airplane. So George opened up his aquarium and let us volunteer in all the tanks. And we were feeding the sharks and waving to them and, and the rays and the this and the that. And it was fantastic. And then George and I connected on a, a commercial opportunity, which we'll talk about as well. So it's a straight line from the humanitarian piece to the nonprofit piece and also the synergy between companies. So the pandemic was pretty special for us in, well, in that way. Maybe we can, we can put Avery on the spot because I think there are, on the live stream there may be a bunch of young people watching and I know there are at least two, uh, there's a nine and 11 year old in the back that really are impressed with you and they, they wanna hear uh, your story. But how, I know your dad is really good at this, but um, how did you come about like doing this? How did you decide to do this and where did that idea come from? So we are um, the adventure type. We like to explore things that a lot of people don't because they just think it's not cool. Um, and in my school life, I always sort of like to do Tinker Lab or I like to experiment and do things where I can create um, and inspire others to create things for their own and make opportunities. Um, and ever since I was little, I wanted to become a marine biologist and we would always go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium and by the time I was six, it was my first time in the tide pool. Uh, that was the first time ever wearing a scuba tank. And at the time, it was freezing and the water was cold, so I didn't really enjoy it that much. Um, but then one week into the lockdown, my dad came into my room. And he's like, what are we going to do? He's like, we're not just going to sit in bed all day. And that's when both at almost the same time we said scuba. And from there, he. Um, we found Marin Diving Center. Uh, we got connections and we started to launch into the um, scuba certifications. Um, and it's just been a great journey from there. All right, can I follow up with one more? Yeah. So, I mean, it must be hard. I, I don't know, I, I don't do it that much. So, so, I mean, you have to get up early, right? You have to get up early or you have, what, what, what makes it hard to get or easier to get in cold water? I mean, how do you, how do you get the gumption or the grit to do that? It's mostly, it's just so thrilling being underwater. It's being in a different universe and that in itself is just such a great experience that the temperature or the conditions don't really matter. Um, and I think just being able to do something hard for the reward is um, the part that makes me wake up early or go in the water despite the weather. It's pretty good. It's just I know. <laughs> well, I mean, I, John, you manage a lot of people. I mean, like, how do you, how do you train grit into kids? So we need a DNA <laughs> test. I mean, her mother is, uh, is, is fantastic, but uh, I don't know where, where she gets it. We try our best, but she's, uh, she's an operator. Well, tenacious. Well, I, so, like, let's talk a little bit about kind of, uh, like, 
where the kind of the idea to kind of do something with the aquarium by the bay came from and a little bit about drawing, you know, kind of your entrepreneurial side and, and kind of what ended up happening as a result of kind of this, this emerging partnership with Aquarium by the Bay? Well, I want to turn it over to George as well, but um, these guys, as George mentioned, were under siege, and so are a lot of uh, people that you're talking with today. And so we really architected a, a partnership, uh, George's budget in some of these departments that are responsible for teaching the next generation about the oceans uh, are leaving something to be desired. And we yeah. took a look at these things and said, how can we raise money and how can we help? And one idea we had is um, the first few times that we were diving, uh, you meet a, um, in, in George's Aquarium, this is San Francisco Aquarium by the Bay, if you've been there, it's a 250 pound sea bass and it just comes at you. Um, and, and we thought, well, let's launch a, um, a project. Uh, NFTs are something we're involved in in a company. And let's launch a project where someone could bid to name the giant sea bass in the aquarium and, and, and de facto adopt the creature. And we did that. And we raised you know, 15000 right away from a bidder who renamed it General Zod. Uh, which is, oh Lord, which, is, which is, hasn't <laughs> taken root yet, but I wave and sort of trying to get him to adopt it. And these things live for 75 years. So embedded in the NFT is also pictures of the darling uh, creature every you know year or so for in perpetuity. So it's a great asset. Well, before I, I think George, we want to show some pictures of this, but before we do, maybe we could just explain this amorphous concept of NFT and what is what what is that? Because I don't think all of our audience really has a full understanding of that just yet. Yeah, uh, so NFTs are um, assets that live at the smart contract level. Uh, I was running a deal during the dot-com days, and don't be fooled, the reporters who are out today saying that NFTs are a joke and they're just JPEGs, they did the same thing when, uh, they talked about eBay, you know, the same way, uh, way back when. And you, you don't want to get pulled into that. Uh, the, the young people have these fantastic opportunities and you don't want to push them away from I think the biggest uh, point of, of growth and explosion that we've, we've ever seen. So an NFT is an asset that lives at the smart contract level and anything commoditizable, anything auctionable, anything that you want to uh, put up there, it, it, it can be uh, managed and live and breathe and change. It can be subject to rules and algorithms and that's the smart contract. And then it can also be subject to pricing that you can see historically. So you can see all the different prices that a house uh, uh, sold for, but you can't see all the different prices of uh, a trading card necessarily online or, or, or pieces of art or anything else. So it's this fantastic thing, and whether it's a derivative of crypto or whether crypto is a derivative of it, of, uh, of NFTs remains to be seen, but it's, it's explosive. Um, and the communities that are establishing, including the one that we're building uh, with the aquarium, it's not just adopting a fish, but it is a series of NFTs so that you can participate uh, as a, uh, a bona fide member of the aquarium this way, and you get special <clears throat> access control yeah. and thereabouts. Well, I want to I wanna just ground to John that um, you, you said it, one thing that at the end that is it's all about making community and community. Um, the, the term NFT means non fungible token, and these tokens also they represent something that is another term in this space, this idea of distributed organizations or distributed, and we call them sometimes distributed autonomous organizations. And so what you're doing is you're saying like, we don't have to think about necessarily uh, just San Francisco being a part of our aquarium here. We can think about this network being larger. And so I think that's a really interesting, this interesting thing you're onto there is that supporting this ecosystem, and maybe even if we grow this more, supporting the planet, is a distributed function and therefore can be supported by these new distributed tools that our young people are inventing through, through blockchain. So, and George, you want to talk, show, talk to us a little bit about the practicalities of the, what that looks like at the, or what Avery's experience looked like at the, at, at the aquarium? Um, I was actually out of the country um, a couple of times when she died, but the pictures and the reaction of our staff, and um, it was pretty phenomenal. And um, I actually saw a bunch of pictures this morning as well. It was pretty fantastic. And not just the dive portion of it, not just the auction portion of it, but also that she was performing magic tricks uh, in our tanks. And, um, you know, this has probably never been done at any aquarium, so thank you for doing that. She's probably the first one in the U.S. to have performed magic tricks underwater inside an aquarium tank. 
And our tanks are, you know, we have two tunnels at the aquarium. They hold 750,000 gallons of salt water. So they're pretty heavy duty tanks. And so thank you for energizing the tanks and uh, sharing the magic. Yeah, I think we, uh, maybe we could toggle to see those. Uh, I think we have some pictures of some, some magic. Maybe tell us a little bit about Avery. What, so what's the deal with underwater magic? That's a thing? Yes, it is. It's um, a great experience. Uh, my instructor, Chef Anton, um, first you have to go in the pool and learn several tricks. Wait, um, is he really a chef? Yes, he is one of many things. He's a pretty crazy guy. Um, you have to have dinner with this guy. He's just yeah. incredible. Magic tricks at the table and everything. Yeah. Um, so this is my family here. One of the things is um, it's maintaining an audience. It's making uh, people's experiences more memorable, which was one of the reasons I got hooked on this, because the fact that a young kid can walk through the tunnel and remember me uh, doing a scuba magic trick for them is um, something I would like to um, make them think about and show them that even though how um, silly that might look, it's so great to look into a tunnel and see people smiling and be like, hey, you come here and I can show you something great. And I think that's um, a message that if it's the only message I can get through to people that doing anything, even though how um, silly it might look or even stupid at some point, um, it's just great. And it shows that sometimes doing different things lead to making um, very memorable experiences for young people. So, so what are you doing in this photo right here? There, is this a specific trick? Yeah, so that's a trick where I make that ribbon come up from my hand and it just disappears, but it's, um, yeah, it just comes out yeah, of my you, hand. You, and if you're not swallowing a sword underwater, I'm, no, I'm yeah. under, <laughs> underwhelmed. Yeah. <laughs> He, right. he didn't mean that. I'm, no. I, 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 <laughs> sorry, Dad. No, flame throwing is really one of yes. <laughs> in, in Avery's quick defense, this is there's a current in the tank. Um, the, the George mentioned the salt water, the density. Her buoyancy has to be near perfect um, so that she can hang there. And then doing these tricks, um, it, it was just unreal. unreal. Well, I was just in there watching, and I was fatigued. I asked how much longer, 10 minutes before uh, it was ready to go. You, you must have learned so much, Avery. Is it, I mean, like... Yeah, um, mostly it's learning how to multitask. That was a huge... Um, just thing. Yeah, you have to learn. It's um, being able to manage an audience and showing people how to do things that are never done before. That was something that was a little nerve wracking the first time is, you know, I'm the, um, the youngest person to do this and, you know, making sure that showing up the younger people that it's possible, obviously didn't want to mess up because that wouldn't have been such a great message. But um, having great instructors and people who are willing to teach you and, and help you become something that can inspire others um, was something very valuable I learned from this. And I hope that from other younger people who um, even when I was doing my pool certification, a 10-year-old came up to me and said, oh, how do you do that? And I just taught him a trick. And that's something that's um, really special is being able to teach people, even though I'm only two years older than them, um, how to do something that could change a person's life. And it sounds like, you know, when after the magic or before the magic was when this idea happened to help support financially through the NF the non-fungible token or the NFT sale with, with George's operation? Yeah, we've raised uh, about 50,000 uh, to date and we're forecasting uh, hundreds of thousands. It has to get going, the community has to uh, take root. But it's really one of those examples. I mean, look at, at our, our daughter's experience, our family's experience that led to this um, synergy between one business um, and, a, and a nonprofit. And so as you're exploring development, um, and as you're exploring what, what to do these days as the world presumably opens up and things get a little bit you know, back to normal, that these partnerships um, in Evangelion for Good are, are possible. Uh, because I, I've not sourced more fulfillment either uh, professionally or personally than through this uh, partnership. And we've been, we've been around, uh, but this, is, this was very special and it's ongoing. And if it can really help uh, not just this aquarium, but others and museums and all kinds of folks. Um, we think that's something to consider. Well, I think we have a. I think we might have a photo of that of the thing that you did to share with everyone. Um, of I think this is is this a. I think there's there's a photo of the NFT at some point. But one thing to want to remind folks: if you have questions for Avery or for George or John, we do have question cards to fill those out, and we can entertain those. But you know, when we think about the future, you know, of where this is going, George, it's, it's interesting that so you have this partnership, you've been able to sustain your operations, but, but where does it go, really? 
So the auction part, I think we've just tapped the, you know, scratched the surface, if you will. There is a tremendous potential in expanding it to different realms, not just the species that we hold, but ocean-based art, STEM education, STEAM education, you know, the possibilities are endless. Uh, where the aquarium is going is we are in the process of transforming the aquarium into a climate and ocean conservation living museum. So this is a $260 million project that we are working on right now on the Embarcadero. In addition to that, we are also designing climate centers in Norway and in Jamaica. And I think there are a couple of visuals of that. But uh, as far as the NFT goes, uh, you know, the sky's the limit. And it's an untapped uh, sector where the nonprofits, such as the Aquarium of the Bay, you know, there are more than 200 accredited aquariums in, in, in the United States and zoos that can tremendously benefit from, you know, what we have accomplished here in San Francisco as a pioneer organization. And thanks to John, I mean, the possibilities are said like endless. Well, I think, I think we see, uh, for, for those of us in the audience, and hopefully you, you online can see some of the vision that you have on the screen for what we have here, can have here potentially in San Francisco. Right, so the aquarium is right under the bigger canopy that you see there. And then there's a research lab, a floating research lab, which is a smaller bubble. And then there's an AI-driven device, which is the, sm the smallest bubble that you see in the middle. Wow, okay, so we, we talked before about AI milking robots, and now we're, we're like looking at research vehicles. And, did you guys see that? The, the milking robot, that was pretty awesome, right? <laughs> but, okay, so can I just pretend that I'm a total neophyte and tell me, okay, I don't own any NFTs, and I don't understand this idea of an auction. John, how, how does that, how does that, what are the mechanics of that? If I, if I want to like go and buy an NFT and how, how does that actually work with, with your company, with VC NFT, and how does it actually work with supporting George? So an NFT you can buy in a variety of different ways. Um, and there are platforms, there are, uh, are pursuits to do that. It's, um, I know that crypto is a little annoying and you have to authenticate yourself and getting used to it. But I'm talking to George right now, it's not a formal uh, announcement, but we're talking about it using crypto to feed his fish. Um, and, and you can adopt them that way and then they can grow that way and they can morph into different uh, creatures that way. So the gamification, if you will, and getting younger and younger people interested in this stuff um, is, is very powerful. But an, an NFT is, is something that you can uh, package yourself quickly and sell or you can buy quickly. You keep it in, a, in an electronic wallet. Um, and what it's done with this partnership is enabled the aquarium, uh, just like a major restaurant that we'll announce soon, just like major museums or anything else, to write itself, to, to equalize that wobble. Um, to, a new uh, revenue source. A, a new revenue source, yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it's really cool. And you, uh, doing all these exciting things, have been the catalyst to a major you know, business part partnership as well. So the efficacy of uh, what a young person can do that brought us all together is, um, is also innovating for good. I think that's incredible. And so I can just go to this VC NFT site and I can do a lot of good and I can actually support, you know, we can, we can support our museums, our social institutions, uh, our environmental advocacy groups. And so did you ever think that you would have this much impact just by going diving? Uh, not really, but I feel um, as I kept going along and um, people coming up to me and being like, oh, that's so great, I didn't even know that existed, um, that's just made me keep going that the fact that so many people didn't even know about this and that um, with the resources that people have given me um, to continue doing what I'm doing, I think that's it's just really great to see where I've gone today and um, where I'll keep going. We have a limited amount of time, so I'm gonna give John the final word because we've been handing out John's book to folks today, and there's something that really resonates with me about John's book, is that John really focuses on his family, who, who many of whom are here today, and it's really interesting the way that you have prioritized your family, not only through the pandemic, but through this incredible partnership. And so I, I wanted to ask you, you know, you've scaled a lot of companies, and you, you seem to be very grounded in the values of, of uh, connecting with people you love and things you love. And so do you have, do you have any advice for the young leaders, the aspiring uh, you know, executives that are in this room uh, to carry forward from, from this experience and your experience in running multiple businesses? Yeah, marry the right person is what I say to <laughs> uh, 
uh, all of uh, the students and, and, and employees and everything else, they don't teach you that. I just went back to my high school and college and everything else. And, you know, just tell us that. That's all we need. You don't need all the... Uh, my, my wife is here. She was in one of the images where she's looking at uh, Adarla. She was looking at Avery um, in, through the glass. Um, she's been with us every step of the way uh, in this whole process. This is walking down sandy beaches in Monterey with all the gear and helping us and making sure that Avery stays alive. It's not easy for your significant other to watch as you're 40 feet under uh, the ocean and a thousand meters away. But um, if you can be engaged in commerce, and this is a literal manifestation of it's easy to talk that way. If you can be engaged um, in commerce, uh, but put your family first, which is literally the manifestation of this exercise, that's, that's a key ingredient. And before all you young people rush out and say, well, you know, I want to be bigger than what you're describing and I want to take over the world, um, there are real costs and there's real, you know, uh, intangibles associated with that. So all the guys that have just crushed the ball and are world famous, they owe it to come up here as well and talk about how it really happened and how much luck has to do with that and everything else. So if you're going to be subject to that, um, you might as well uh, be subjected to the, uh, what's most important in the world. And to, to us, that's our, that's our team right there. All right. Um, final word, George? Final word, Avery? Yeah. yeah, before we leave the stage, we have three things for Avery. Okay, what else? That's crazy. We have a citation oh. for you here from the Aquarium of the Bay. That's crazy. <laughs> to the youngest scuba magician inside an aquarium. Wow. The second one is coming to you from Germany. It's not here yet. And it's a uh, shark that is painted by um, a lot of activists and those who believe in their welfare and uh, habitat. So it's on its way. The third one, Come over here. Uh, this is not a crypto loot. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, what I call a good luck charm. Oh. It's, it's an octopus. Oh, wow. Um, oh, that's cool. Made by a local artist. So thank you for all you do. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank, thank you, everybody. Um, one more thing before John leaves. If we could toggle over to that other presentation. The story doesn't end here. Actually, John's working on a fundraiser with us on the campus, and VCNFT is actually helping us create our own community, and uh, his company's actually helping us sell NFTs for my book, which actually go to support the School of Management. So thank you, John, for that. Uh, we really appreciate your partnership. Avery? Thank you You're so amazing. Much. Very thank impressive. You. So thank, let's give these folks a hand. Um, so we're gonna take we're going to take a short break and reset the stage, and, but don't go anywhere because this next panel is awesome. So uh, please uh, stick around uh, eight minutes and be back in your seats. All right. Uh, welcome back. Uh, you know, before we have our, our next panelists up, um, I want to introduce uh, Vipul Vias, who's a faculty colleague of mine. Uh, come on up here, Vipul. Vipul is a friend of long years. Our sons went to elementary school together, and um, you're going to sit right over here, Vipul. Um, so uh, Vipul and I have actually been working here at University of San Francisco on something that tears off something that John talked about, which is this idea of using non-fungible tokens. Yes, you probably don't know what they are yet, but using blockchain to, to figure out how we do real stuff. And I think that's what you're gonna see some of these people talking about is doing real stuff, but doing real stuff with finances. And so interestingly, we've been having this idea of how do we enable uh, organizations to deliver services in distributed ways. So using distributed organizations to do to deliver financial and climate solutions. And why I want to set that up is because we're doing a lot of innovative stuff here at University of San Francisco that underlies a lot of the stuff that you're going to hear about from these panelists. And so interestingly, and Vipul can maybe reference this a little bit, is that we have a pilot project where we're, we're using distributed networks in a large city that happens to be maybe across the bay, it's in Oakland actually, um, to plant, to plant 2,000 trees. Uh, and we're doing it using citizen labor. And we're actually doing it in, through incentives and using a blockchain-based process to archive those and provide valid results. And so here's a little graphic of that. And I like to say that Every one of these people you're going to hear from today are all about building community and economic value and doing a way that actually is climate positive. 
And Ravi, if I got that wrong, you can chastise me later, but uh, Ravi, Alex, my whole rest of you people, welcome to the stage. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it was like six people. I can't, I can't. So well, come up. I, I really, I'm so excited about this conversation. We're going to talk a lot about finance and structures. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Vipul, who can introduce this illustrious view, uh, group from, from across the country, actually. I've had a pleasure to get to meet some of you folks in the backstage, but I'll actually let you guys introduce yourselves. This is sort of a therapy session for me, so you guys are my <laughs> therapist uh, tonight around climate change. And I'm probably the least impressive person uh, up here, so I'll let you guys start uh, wowing the crowd. And we understand we're probably the last thing between folks and drinks, so we'll try to make <laughs> this thing exciting. All right, I guess I'm starting off. Hi, everyone. Ravi Mickelson, uh, one of the co-founders of Atmos Financial. Uh, I've been in the climate and clean energy space for 22 years come this August. Uh, engineer by training, switched over to finance because uh, I saw the need for uh, greater deployment of capital uh, for this transition. Specifically, Atmos Financial is looking to leverage the $170 trillion of bank deposits. That's our money around the world uh, for this transition because we don't get a say in what the banks directly fund. Uh, with our money, but by choosing where we bank, we do have a say. And so Atmos Financial Fund's only climate positive projects like clean energy, electrification, regenerative agriculture, and we pay you more for that. Um, so we call it no sacrifice banking. Hi, I'm Alex Wright Gladstein. I'm the founder and CEO of Sphere. And my background is also I've spent my whole career in climate. And I started my first company. It's called IR Labs, spinning a technology out of MIT that makes data centers and supercomputers more energy efficient by using light to move data between chips. And when running that company, uh, when we started offering a 401k retirement plan to our employees, I asked for a climate-friendly option in the lineup, thinking it was a simple request. Uh, it ended up taking over three years to get a single climate-friendly option for our employees to invest in. I was shocked by how long it took, how hard it was, and that started me talking to a lot of people in the 401k industry to try to figure out why that was ended up realizing there are some real reasons for it, but none of them are insurmountable. It just seemed like no one had tried to make it easy before to offer climate-friendly options to employees, and so I realized I should probably work on that next. So that's why I founded Sphere, and we're making it easier, easy for employers to offer climate-friendly options to their employees. Awesome. Uh, my name's Zach. I'm one of the founders of Carbon Collective. And similar to Alex, went down uh, a journey of looking at sustainable investing. And the fact is that sustainable investing is broken. We know in order to solve climate change over the next 30 years, we need to dramatically ramp up investments into climate solutions. And at the same time, we need to wind down investments into fossil fuels. And what Wall Street is labeling as sustainable just simply doesn't fit that reality. It is a less bad version of the world today. It is not looking ahead to what we have to build. So at Carbon Collective, we build investment portfolios that are aligned with that reality, that are diversified, that they are low fee, and they're built to be safe for a retirement account, but that have a clear theory of change of what's in there. Um, we work with individuals, and we also work with small and medium businesses businesses to help them out. Great. I'm Catherine Pierce, uh, co-founder and CEO of Carbon Zero Financial. My background's actually behavioral change. Um, so applying that lens of how do we get people to more effectively act and transact according to their concern for people and planet. Um, so Carbon Zero Financial does that. We're a B2B fintech, which means that we work with banks, financial institutions to provide climate technology to existing credit card programs. Um, we enable people to automatically measure, reduce, and offset their card carbon footprint as they spend, um, exercising credit card rewards points towards offsetting, but also because I have information on how you spend, I can tell you the exact ways that you can most effectively reduce your carbon footprint. Um, so meeting people where they are to get them where they need to be using financial data to gamify climate accountability. I'm James, I'm the CEO of Evergrow. Our mission is to build and sustain a carbon neutral world. The way we do that is by unlocking project finance for decarbonization, decarbonization and new infrastructure. 
we need to spend on the order of five to ten trillion dollars a year investing in new things like solar and wind, yes, but also low carbon fuels, um, carbon capture, you name it. And the current project finance markets don't know what to do with these projects. They see them as too risky to invest in. So we write long term price guarantees and other contracts that make these projects work from a financing perspective, thus unlocking decarbonization projects into the future. I also wanted to say thank you to the Commonwealth Club for having me and us here. When I, five years ago, was looking for an opportunity to get into climate, I started by coming literally to this room uh, to listen to the tapings of the Climate One podcast, uh, which was an incredible jumping off point for my journey. So it's great to be back. So two things. Clearly, they've done this before. And <laughs> second, from a therapy perspective, I feel much better that you guys are actually out there. Doing, and that's doing, the panel now. Exactly. <laughs> I feel better. I'm good. Um, I wanted to ask a, a few questions, one of which is um, from a social momentum perspective, do you see any steam being lost in terms of engagement around climate and you know, dealing with climate change? Is there sort of any reactionary pushback that you're sensing in the market? If so, or if not, you know, what are you guys doing to address it, either to amp up more interest in uh, climate uh, change um, issues or uh, pushing back where there may be some resistance? Yeah. I mean, is there a specific sort of like moment that you're thinking of that was this team lost? Because, well, you know, if we look at the political climate where we're heading to in the next two to four years, there may be a change of political control in terms of power and probably implications. And that probably also reflects sentiment by virtue of that transition. Yeah, I would I would start off and say that like Washington, D.C. is not the U.S. and not the world. And, you know, broadly, steam is only increasing the, the, the pressure that people are feeling to act um, has only been growing. Like two decades ago, it was a pretty lonely place and it was me shouting at my friends to turn off lights and you know do things. Um, and now so many of them are working in some regards, not even in climate, but they're running the, the energy departments for their companies or like procuring renewable energy for, you know, for large corporates, things like that. So the last few years especially, it's been growing and every day we're seeing people wanted to work on climate or move their money or do more. So I'd say broadly it's increasing, not decreasing. And you're totally right to say that DC is not the country nor the world. Um, from my perspective, I, f I founded my first company in 2015, and it's a semiconductor company, and I had been deep in climate stuff my whole life up until 2015. And then I was all in on semiconductor, stopped going to climate change conferences for a while because I needed to get this company to be successful. Five years later, 2020 was when I kind of lifted my head up and started paying attention to climate and that conversation again. And I could not believe it. It was night and day in how people reacted to me bringing up the topic. I always felt like the crazy person in the corner being like, guys, we should be worried about this. And most people were like, oh yeah, you know, whatever. Uh, and all of a sudden, 2020, every time I brought it up, people were leaning in and saying, yes, I'm worried too. What can we do? And the numbers back it up. So we went from 30% of Americans being worried about climate change in 2015 to over 80, I think it's 82% in 2020, and a majority of both political parties. So uh, to your point, it's not just Democrats who want the change. It's also a majority of Republicans. It's just their politicians who aren't doing what the majority of their party wants. Uh, Feeling better again. <laughs> So um, the other thought I had when you first asked the question, I thought you were going a different way with it. I thought you were bringing up the skyrocketing prices of oil and how well mm -hmm. the fossil fuel industry is doing all of a sudden, because uh, that has had an impact on us. Our first product is um, a fund that's much like the S&P 500, except that uh, it doesn't invest in the fossil fuel industry. and. Over the long term, historically, that has improved returns. But all of a sudden now, with oil prices skyrocketing, people are thinking, oh, wow, it's time to invest in fossil fuels. Um, but with that said, it, it's, I've realized it's actually a very tiny portion of people who are see thinking that way. Um, I think just the fact that people have been feeling and experiencing climate change firsthand with the wildfires and the hurricanes makes them realize, wait a second, do you want to go back into the same thing or do we want to be a little more thoughtful about this and plan for alternatives, you know, the renewables, the electrical, electrifying of homes, et cetera, rather than going right back to, to the fossil fuels that can swing this way, so. I think Alex's comment on oil prices is really important. 
Um, something that I think is underreported is the relationship between oil and gasoline prices and carbon prices. Uh, they tend to be anti-correlated, meaning that when oil prices and gasoline prices are high, people change their behavior uh, and they consume less, but that weirdly depresses the price of emissions. It's both a good thing in that people are emitting less, but that price signal that the price of carbon represents in the carbon markets is really, really important to a developer building their project. To give you an example, the price of the low carbon fuel standard in California was about 200 bucks a metric ton a year and a half ago. It was 150 bucks a metric ton on Jan 1, 2022, and it's now at about 115 bucks as of today, generally because of sentiments around, yes, the political climate, but also in particular oil prices. And that in turn makes it really hard for the next generation of replacement fuels like biofuels developers or sustainable jet fuel producers to get their projects funded because carbon is now cheaper. I think something I would add here, and maybe this goes a little bit to that feeling that you have of like, are we stalling, is that I think the awareness of climate change is at a point where it's never been. Um, but what that's leaving us, so many of us is at the top of the emotional cycle where we say, oh my God, I'm terrified. And we still, I think, you know, as and this is what you were talking about with that behavioral piece, mm -hmm. we aren't yet good enough yet as a community to say, okay, and this is what we have to do globally, and this is what you have to do individually. It can often feel like a laundry list. I'll give a really quick example that was pretty relevant. My cousin has a third grader, and she had, they had a play that they put on. And it was one kid after another coming out saying, I am the polar bear. I am the polar bear. Who will save me? Who will save me? I am the sea otter. I am the sea otter, et cetera. There wasn't, you know, I am a solar panel. I'm a wind turbine. I am an electric car. There, there, so there's just angst, but no there's no, release. there's no resolution. And that is the definition of climate anxiety, which can lead us just to this place of, this is horrible. I was born into a world run by fossil fuels. And, but we do have the way out of it. And I think so much of that is education to continue and close that loop. And I would just actually add to that, the pillars kind of upon which we've strategized is education, innovation, automation. So once we've identified these are things about where we're all concerned, these are things that we, these are in fact individual and communal goals, how do we build systems around that shared intention? This is not, this is very much in fact agnostic to political party, to planet Earth is our most expansive yet common ground. I think the pandemic made it very clear we do share a certain fate. We are very aware of our susceptibility to these things. And I, I would say the climate consciousness is greater than it's ever been before. But the, ex the exciting opportunity is now, all right, we have this angst. In what capacity can technology, finance, data, really every industry facilitate in turning that into action? Um, and I think that's what's brought us here today. And you guys are all innovating. And in the spirit of innovation, you're doing obviously new things. What, and I, and I hear a lot of financial services type work that's being done. What regulatory issues do you run into, if any? Um, because you guys are probably out a little bit ahead of where that framework, those frameworks may exist today. Maybe it's, maybe it's a cakewalk. James probably started. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure, I mean, where to start? Our, our markets exist purely as a function of regulation. You know, carbon, if you think about it, is not a physical commodity in the way that oil and gas are, right? We don't consume carbon, it doesn't work like that. And so when we say a price on carbon, what we really mean is that governments have gone out and created these markets in which emitters are limited as to how much they can emit. And that artificial scarcity, because it is artificial, creates supply and demand that mimics a regular commodity market and looks and feels, walks and quacks like a commodity market, but isn't actually one. In that absent regulation, there's literally zero value for this stuff. And I can tell a story that illuminates it. Um, one of our early customers is a producer of sustainable jet fuel. They turn waste wood into jet fuel. And this is wood that would otherwise have died and decomposed. Um, You'd think that a jet fuel plant would make its money selling jet fuel, um, but you'd be wrong. This plant makes 20% of its revenue selling jet fuel. The remaining 80% of its revenue comes from carbon credits, which are a creation of regulation. And so absent regulation, this stuff doesn't get built and just doesn't happen. So um, regulation is, is kind of the bread and butter of our business. You're probably one of the few people who would thank regulators. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, I'm very long regulation. I, I think if it were the, the right thing to do for people to stop emitting, we wouldn't have a climate crisis. Yeah. I'll pile on to that. Um, 
the Department of Labor is what regulates retirement plans, these 401ks, 403bs, um, and they basically tell employers what they have to do to uh, meet their fiduciary responsibility in giving investment options to their employees. And right now, the Department of Labor is in the process of developing new guidelines for, for that fiduciary responsibility in which they say, hey, you know what? Climate risk is financial risk. You might not be meeting your fiduciary duty if you're not taking into account climate risk. Uh, and that will be a huge change when that does come out. And it, I would expect it to probably come out saying exactly that because there was a proposed um, guideline that came out. It received public commentary and that was overwhelmingly in favor. And so now it's being finalized and I think is expected to come out saying exactly that, which is very exciting because it kind of opens the floodgates of, okay, now employers have free reign to take into account things besides just pure risk and return measures when they're deciding what to put in 401ks. Yeah. To further add to the pile, so the SEC put out a, a ruling that publicly traded companies will have to start to disclose their, uh, their climate risks. Uh, and so many of the banks... Uh, are publicly traded, even small community banks. And so they're looking at what's our climate risk for our, our lending portfolio. So we're having those conversations right now uh, to help them out. Uh, and then also the Federal Reserve. So looking at like what is the, the climate risk of our institutions, Fannie Mae and Fe Freddie Mac, uh, you know, trillions of dollars of mortgages, home mortgages, commercial mortgages across the country. Many of them are in flood zones, hurricane zones, earthquakes. So there's earthquakes are not necessarily climate, uh, you know, climate related, but many others are wildfires here in California. So looking at, you know, how do we price in that risk to mortgages? How do we buy them and then held and backed by the federal government? And then, you know, sort of on the, the anti side of this is all sort of positive tailwind regulation for us here in California. Uh, we had a, a law passed that said all new homes starting, you know, I think it was this year, all new homes have to have solar on it where it's feasible. Uh, but then the investor owned utilities like PG&E based here in San Francisco put forward a proposed change to the net energy metering, how we sell back credits. And that went to the Public Utility Commission who's considering it, which basically uh, making it uneconomical for people to add solar. So we're forcing people to add solar, but then saying it's not going to be all that great for you economically anymore. So regulations can be a headwind or a tailwind, and we need to like work together so that it's actually getting us to where we need to be. Yeah. Regulators that conflict opinions never happen. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> uh, I think uh, we talk about price of oil. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize that when they put their money in a bank, you know, one of the money center banks, a lot of that money, a shocking amount of that money, actually funds fossil fuel related projects. And how have you guys done, you know, a lot of you guys are B2B, but some of you are B2C in terms of increasing awareness of these types of issues for the purposes of acquisition from a, from a marketing perspective and, you know, from a mission perspective both? Happy to jump on this sure. first, yeah. but I imagine, <laughs> yeah, this is mainly going to be over here. Um, yeah, it's one of the questions that we often get is, um, you know, we, we help people invest, uh, and you touched on this a little bit, Alex, is, you know, there's this notion in this narrative that it is a fundamentally charitable act to invest sustainably. That when we get people all the time, like, all right, I'm ready to work with Carbon Collective, and I'm going to accept a couple percentage points worth of performance. And we just that doesn't add up to us. We don't think that that's actually correct. When we look at kind of the long-term trajectory of fossil fuels, next 10, 20, 30 years, the macroeconomic trends tell the opposite tale. We have you know, 50% of the oil that's consumed in the US is used on our roadways. We have a fundamentally better technology called an electric car that does not use oil. They're faster, safer, more reliable. You can drive a Tesla for over a million miles. In the next five years, they'll be cheaper to own. So where's oil's market share going with that? Solar, wind, battery, cheaper ways of generating electricity. So when it comes to investing, so much of what's important here is that narrative because the point of divesting from an ethical perspective is to help spread that to the point where we can get those who, who are financially motivated to then say, oh, I'm gonna switch to that too. 
because I believe that this is going to make more money. And that's the tipping point that I believe that we're all trying to aim for in changing where investment is allocated. I'll just mention on the performance, since you were talking about it, we have a 10-year back test where we show our index compared to the S&P 500. What happens if all you do is remove fossil fuel companies? And our line is green and the S&P 500 is red and ours just consistently gets higher and higher. And it just shows, I think that graph is so powerful in, in sharing that message of, hey, it's actually better for your pocketbook as well as for the planet to make this decision. You don't have to compromise. And you can go back even further. I was born in 1989. If you had divested from the S&P 500 in that year up until the present, you would have made more money. That's a long time period. And that includes a decade because investment advisors will say, oh, you hold fossil fuel companies because they're counter cyclical. You hold them as a hedge. Um, in the 2000s, the S&P 500 was basically flat, but the fossil fuel industry in the US was up 350%. And yet still, over that time period, those 32 years, my whole lifetime, you would have been better to divest. So the narrative that they are an important piece of a portfolio is really coming into question. I think also, though, for us, initially we were B2C, so we were going to launch our own credit card product, after which we pivoted because it was more scalable. Um, but for us, so much of it's also getting people back to what is money? Money is the mechanism, it's a mechanism by which we express value. We can align that with our values. <laughs> I think we feel very powerless. Many of us actually don't like the companies with whom we transact. We actually feel kind of yucky about um, the brands from whom we shop and these various things. Changing the narrative, to your point, we, can, we have options. We can be empowered in how we spend. There are alternatives. And if we can make it easier for people to capitalize on those alternatives. Earlier, I think throughout a theme has been the ease with which people can do this. How easily can I switch to more sustainable mechanisms? So for us, the narrative is also your money can be an alignment of your, your values. And there's options. And we're going to make it easier than ever to act accordingly. Um, so that's a huge part of it feeling like I get to put dignity back into my dollar, I get to act with integrity, and I'm not powerless to the system. As those responsible for running a business and at the intersection of obviously enterprise and climate change, what one, maybe two key measures do you use to determine whether you're tacking to your North Star and tacking to success or not? Is there something that you focus on? Yeah, for us it's, dollars moved from the banks, you know, from the big banks towards these climate positive, positive projects. It doesn't, we don't care how many people sign up or don't sign up or share us out. It's how much money are we moving towards this? Because at the end of the day, that's what matters is shifting the energy infrastructure. For us, it's very similar. It's just dollars removed from the fossil fuel industry. Because for us, it's all about sending a message to the fossil fuel industry that it's not just business as usual, we don't want to stick with the status quo. We're not okay with what they're doing. We need a major change, and so we're taking our money away from them to send that message. So it's a very clear just how many dollars have we removed, and I think that's powerful, especially within 401ks, because people can have an amazing impact just within their own spheres of influence. Uh, let's say you work at Microsoft or at Apple. There are anywhere from 10 to 30 billion dollars in your 401k plan alone, just within your own company. So if you can influence your benefits managers to add a single climate-friendly investment option into your company's 401k, you can pretty much single-handedly be responsible for a billion dollars coming out of the fossil fuel industry. So letting people know that they can single-handedly have such a huge impact is really empowering and can really provide a, a counter to that climate angst and uh, depression that is really becoming so prevalent these days. People have power and, and we're helping them take that power. Yeah, I, I think on that note, one of the questions we often get, and this is a little bit tangential, is, all right, I'm one person how should I prioritize my own climate actions? Like, do I be vegan? Do I bike to work today? What do you do? And for us, what we like to say is tr tr take the time to pick up the big parts of your life. So like a banking, for instance. Changing your bank kind of sucks. Let's be honest. You have to like do all those things. No, that, it can be pretty easy. Ah. Pretty easy. <laughs> you, you have to, you have to reconnect all these things, but don't, don't worry. I'm, I'm going to give you a good plug here. He makes it super easy. He makes it super easy. <laughs> you, but you pick up the decision. You look at it from all angles, and then you do it, and then you're done. 
then you're just banking. You're living your life. You're not having to think every day because decision fatigue is such an important part of that. So whether it's your banking, whether it's where you're investing, how you source your electricity, how you transport yourself, how you cook your food, these are big one-time decisions that have a, you know, decades of impact in making. So do the big stuff, pick it up, take the time with it, but then put it down and you get to go on living your life. Yeah, I think um, we think a lot about kind of lowering carbon impact, raising carbon consciousness. Uh, and so one is the reallocation of resources. Are people actually diverting their buying power such that they're either offsetting, but ideally actually just shopping more sustainably. So in our affiliate marketplace, kind of targeting people and saying, we're seeing how you're shopping. I'm gonna get you the best discount possible to shop more sustainably with this brand. And those high ticket items like clean energy, energy efficient appliances. Um, so for us, it's very much about the reallocation of resources um, such that people are making better decisions and then also, I mean, again, behavioral change, that also is kind of the psyche of what do people feel like their relationship to climate is? When people are disempowered, they're less likely to hold other stakeholders accountable. However, when they feel like they are gradually contributing to the solution, there's some indignation there. And then they go to their employer and they say, what's up with my 401k? Then they go to their politicians and they say, what's up with this policy? So gradually making people feel like they are mobilizing and they are in fact part of the solution really has huge implications. Um, so it's both for us the actual dollars and cents and then what are, what are people's own relationships to climate as a concept? For us, we just look at how much a project that we helped finance um, reduces or abates over its lifetime, and we measure our success by reference to that. Our goal is to get to a gigaton by 2030. So I'm getting a very Star of the Beast vibe. Um, and I guess akin to that is what probably happened with investments in uh, South Africa you know, several decades ago, or you know, the tobacco industry uh, several dec decades ago as well. Um, and as entrepreneurs in this environment uh, as we sit here in April 2022, what are your biggest challenges, you know, beyond climate change, just developing and growing your business? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, Let's one, keep it everybody uh, up. yeah, I want to just uh, jump in one. It's not just starving the beast, but it's because that's just the divestment part. It's also the investment. It's like we need to, all of us are also focused on what's the positive. Where do we want to go? Mm -hmm. Because if you just, you know, go fossil free, if you just stop, then you're stopped. It's like, where do we need to go and where, do, where can we all do together? Um, so I want to make that point. And it's like, you know, beyond climate change, what's the, the challenge of growing a business? Um, we all have young companies. It's all, you know, just some of us a few years old, some of us months old. So it's doing all of the things all at once and it's the prioritization. Uh, and how do you not get the distracted by the shiny things that come along to say, you know, it's like, do this instead. It's like always moving forward towards that, that goal. I'll say hiring, and especially hiring thoughtfully, is tough. Um, and I'll put out a plug to anybody who isn't in a climate-related job and who wants to be. We're looking for you, and it's okay if you don't have experience in climate. Um, you know, for me now in the financial industry, I'm, I'm looking for people with a lot of experience in finance who can get passionate about climate and get be able to, to talk about it um, in an intelligent way. And you don't have to have a background to be able to do that. You just need the passion. So if you're thinking about a career change, go for it. We need you. There are a lot of jobs. Yeah, I think for us, there's like there's just a level of faith that you have to have with your hypotheses of this is, you know, you've done enough customer discovery and trying to understand and then seeing if these bets are going to play out that you're making. We're like just starting to see some of those. Um, like, for example, my co-founder met some friends for the first time and he was explaining what he did. And they said, oh, you mean Carbon Collective? And we're like... Uh -huh. Oh my God, <laughs> that's incredible yeah. that you knew about this um, externally. And so it's some of those bets of, of, you know, and being clear, this is what we're doing. And we might not see results from it in six months to 12 months, but we're going to make it and stick to it. I echo all of that. I would, um, even almost from like a philosophical standpoint on, Something I wrestle with a lot is sustainability doesn't just though pertain to like natural resources like trees and whatnot. We too are resources. And in what capacity when you're running a company are you unsustainable? Are you asking for people to extract more than is fair? 
So what does it look like to run a sustainable company vis-a-vis -vis how you treat your employees and the policies you have? And I think that this crisis demands such urgency. So tempering the urgency with which we have to act with the reality that we too need to be modeling, I think, sustainability in how we organize companies. Um, what, how many days a week are they working? What is the, um, so tempering that such that the emotional and actual time burden placed on employees isn't actually unsustainable. So if anyone ever asked that, I would have more hair and it would be more yeah. black and gray. But yeah, go ahead, James. No, mine, mine is echoing Alex's, which is hiring. Um, if I would add a twist to it, um, because I think everything that the panel said is, is right and I would agree with, um, so for the sake of originality. Uh, I <laughs> was talking to a friend of mine the other day who also runs a company, not in climate, um, and I was talking to him, because I took five years off in between my first and second companies, which this is, and I said, man, from, I've forgotten that from the outside looking in at a startup, it's really easy to armchair quarterback it and say, oh, keep your hiring bar high, keep your hiring bar high. And then you, you, you run a company or you work at a company and you realize, Man, the forces that act upon you to want to lower your bar are actually really, really strong. <laughs> you know, like we are an in-person San Francisco, four days a week in the office, high-performing team, but we have so many open roles, and so you start to think, well, how many of these core things are really core? <laughs> and we have someone who ticks eight of the ten boxes, oh, but we said we we're going to keep the bar really high, and so that's a really, really tough behind-the-curtain conversation that we have almost daily. That's great to hear. I mean, it's good that you guys, you know, uh, have been navigating these challenges and are forging ahead. And everyone seems still, you know, committed and not dejected, which is which is great. Um, and I feel better now. So thank you, uh, which is the whole purpose of this panel. Um, so with that, I want to thank everybody. Um, hopefully you learned something like I did uh, from uh, this amazing group of uh, five folks here. Right. All right. <laughs> well, uh, thank you all. Let's see. I, we, they need another hand because managing <laughs> managing a stage of six professionals that actually want to talk a lot. <laughs> and want to talk about the amazing stuff they're doing is a challenge. But I just want to thank you all and the work you're doing, uh, which is incredible. So thank you all. And um, we actually are. We, we really want you to stick around because uh, we are going to do some, a social, social event. And these folks will be around after the event. So please, please uh, don't go anywhere. Uh, we have one fa final speaker we just really want to introduce you to. So thank you all. Um, sure. I do want to highlight, go, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, get off the stage. Just dismissed. Ah. I'm just uh, sitting there. Yeah. Yeah. What do we do? Um, Thank you. So, you know, we've, we've had this trajectory here. We've talked a little bit about uh, 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 climate, uh, like tacit things we can do. We heard about selling NFTs to support uh, <laughs> the environment. Uh, and then we talked about really uh, some financial and some structural things that we can do. And uh, at this point, I really want to dive into kind of a little more of the social side. And it's really a pleasure for me to introduce uh, uh, our next speaker, but also our awardee uh, for this year. And just for context, um, I have to read this because it's really important. But we, we give away an award every year. It's called the Harari Award. Um, and it's uh, centered around this idea of uh, conscious leadership, uh, social entrepreneurship. And so uh, we talk a lot about at the University of San Francisco about um, being a, an entrepreneur isn't just actually doing well and doing good. So I, I always say, like, that's what you do when you prop up your .org. Um, it doesn't mean that your company has values. It, it means that you're maybe doing this thing on the side. And we talk a lot about, what, well, maybe the opposite is actually doing well by doing good, by embedding those values, whether in the social, cultural, environmental, in your company. And uh, we have an award centered around someone who's dedicated a career to that, um, that ethos of leasing socially conscious um, socially conscious companies. And so uh, this year we are, we want to give the award. It's the first time we've ever given an award uh, to a woman. Uh, she's an international expert in social gender equity, economic justice issues, um, a career uh, working in executive roles at the Ford Foundation, outright action, political research associates, but also 
a lot of board experience um, and just giving back to communities. Um, member of the Board of Trustees at the American LGBTQ Museum or LD LGBTQ Plus Museum, uh, the funders of Reproductive Equity, Voices for Pro Profit, Cal Nonprofits, on all of those boards and also CEO of the California Women's Foundation. And just for context, the Women's Foundation uh, is really focused on advancing and building community-based um, and uh, community-based investing, community-based organizations and training community leaders um, who are women and mobilizing women. And I think what inspires me about our world today is we've seen so many powerful young uh, and older women here today. And so without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Serena Khan, uh, my friend, auntie to, to my children who are here and uh, really just- uh, Thank you so much. Uh, so let's just make sure we get this in front of you, Serena. It's so proud of you. So Serena. Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Billy, and, um, and to all of you for having me here. Um, it's really an honor for me to accept this award uh, because of uh, leadership is so important to me. Um, and this award, what it stands for, as I understand it, is integrity, authenticity, and social innovation. And these are all qualities that I aspire to in my own leadership, along with generosity, compassion, and joy. Um, and as CEO of Women's Foundation California, we are a publicly supported foundation advancing gender, racial, and economic justice by investing in, training, and connecting community-based leaders. And our operating principles are grounded in feminist practices. So I was really happy to hear in this last panel about issues around hiring, issues around policies and practices in organizations. That's something that we pay a lot of attention to. Um, and also that our fundamental belief that we were founded upon in 1979 is that people who are closest to the problems in their communities are also closest to the solution. So that's where we need to be looking for innovation. And that's who we are funding, community-based women, trans women, gender non-conforming women who are leading the way. And I see some of the most exciting social innovation coming from women. Uh, trans women, gender non-conforming folks, our community partners, organizations and leaders who we fund, and grassroots community leaders who we train to be effective policy advocates through our Solis Policy Institute. These are leaders who've increased access to renewable energy for low-income communities in California. So that means that 35% of California funds for, for renewable energy are going to low-income communities as a result of our community leaders. These are um, leaders who have expanded labor protections for domestic workers um, or uh, policies that now require cities and counties in California to address environmental justice in their, gender, in, in their general plan and also protecting farm workers for, uh, from overexposure to dangerous pesticides. And we hopefully all know that the reality is that research shows that societies with the least gender equality are the most vulnerable to climate change. The result is that women and girls bear the brunt of floods, windstorms, droughts, wildfires, and heat waves, and slower changes to our seas, land, and agriculture. A staggering 80% of those displaced by climate change are women and girls. And women and children are 14 times more likely than men to die during a natural disaster. So it's imperative that we center women and girls in our response to climate change. California, we all know, is a state of innovation. We're the fifth largest economy in the world um, with some of the most progressive policies in the country, and yet we also have some of the highest poverty rates in the world, and the, people, the majority of people who are living in poverty in California are women of color and their children. Um, and so the success of California and the, the problems of California all involve women. Um, women are leading the way and women are most impacted by the injustice that we see here. Um, I recently learned about uh, uh, something called the No Regrets Initiative, which is a relationship-centered approach to land and asset management, leading with regenerative agriculture, and it's an effort led by women that can be a model for others to use. 
And so in our work, we question the status quo at every turn. We're striving to dismantle structures of patriarchy and white supremacy. And as we look outward to our community partners, we also look inward to our own organizational practices to make sure that they're grounded in feminist practices and management. Um, so just to you know, um, build on what was said in the last panel is that we take a trust-based approach to our philanthropy. So the philanthropic sector is way behind what we are doing in the sense that we don't even require grant applications. We'll take them over the phone. We want movement leaders to be focused on their work and not the bureaucracies of applying for funding. Um, so we've cut out the unnecessary bureaucracies of applying for and reporting on funding. We don't require reports. We want to build relationship with our community leaders and a partnership so that they can focus on their work. And we also take a trust-based approach to managing our team. So what is a feminist um, organization, feminist principles and practices of management look like for us um, is how we support our team. Um, how we center wellness. So as the rest of the country and maybe the world is experiencing the great resignation, we've been experiencing the great retention. Ever since the pandemic started, we've had only two people out of a staff of 25 leave, one to pursue graduate school and another to pursue um, another um, uh, opportunity. The rest of our team has stayed. Why is that? Because we center wellness. And that for us means a four day, 32 hour work week, a flexible schedule, six months of family family leave to bond with a new child or um, to take care of loved ones, uh, technology benefits, a wellness stipend. We used to have, like many organizations, a fitness stipend where you had to show every month your gym membership to get reimbursed $50. Uh, and what we found is that uh, about, you know, about seven people were not opting into that benefit. And so we said, let's make it an opt-out benefit. It's just gonna show up in your paycheck. Uh, and if you don't want it, you can let us know. Well, 100% of people are taking advantage of the wellness benefit. And it's not just for fitness, it's about wellness. So people can use it for any way that they define that. And it might be you know, taking themselves out to dinner, or it might be about taking a yoga class, or, um, or it might be about a gym membership. It doesn't matter what, 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 what wellness is to them is what matters. We have a philanthropy match because we wanna build um, a culture of philanthropy. We have a retirement match. Um, we post our salary ranges. I think that's a very important practice because it contributes to the gender pay gap, pay gap when people don't post salary ranges. I won't even, um, you know, when recruiters call me, I say I won't, I won't forward this to my networks unless you post the salary range. I've started doing that very recently. Um, and we also, while we value education, we don't require a college degree to come work for Women's Foundation California um, because again, it goes back to the principles of those who are closest to the problems are closest to the solution. So if we're trying to reform, for example, the criminal justice system, it might be somebody who's had um, experience, has been previously incarcerated, who might have some of the best ideas about how to reform that, and they may not have had the opportunity to finish their education because of issues to do with poverty, homelessness, addiction. Um, and so uh, we, wanna, we want to make sure um, that we are really values aligned and to that end, again, in the, in the last panel, our investments, 100% of them, are invested in, um, in, in, por in a portfolios that advance gender equity, gender justice, racial justice, and climate justice. Um, our banking, same thing. Um, we got out of the big banks, we're at Beneficial State Bank, and we, there's a lot of progressive banks, but for us, it comes down to gender. So we looked at, for example, Amalgamated Bank, and we looked at Beneficial State Bank. Both are great progressive banks. One is led by a woman, and so we went with that one. So my message to you today is to invest in women's leadership, to center women, to engage women. Women are leading the way, and this is despite the fact that less than 2% of philanthropic dollars go to women and girls, and despite the fact that less than 2% of venture capital funds go to women-owned startups. So it gives me great pleasure to accept this award, especially because, as Billy said, this is the first time that the Harari Award has gone to a woman, and I do hope that there will be many more women who receive this, this award in years to come. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sienna. I, I think that I would be... Uh, 
remiss to put a capstone on that uh, because there are so many wonderful nuggets there. Uh, but I do want to just start, end us off with um, a thank you to Serena for allowing us to honor you and a thank you to our team, uh, Danielle, Susan, Nathan, Tanya, uh, for helping uh, me make this event happen uh, and to all the speakers. Um, and I think the, the challenge that Serena ended on is really tacit and important. And so if you have something to write with or you can anchor something in your head, um, you know, I contemplated how can we get this to stick? Can we create sticky knowledge? Because at the end of the day, I'm a teacher and there's many teachers in the audience. Um, do we have people sign pledge cards when they leave? Um, but you know, I, what I want you to do is just think about what can you do? I, I think you heard from Diane Hagen about can you support a woman owned uh, regenerative agriculture business? Uh, can you do as Serena suggested and some of our panelists up here suggested is change your bank? Uh, can you place your 401k in another institution? Can you uh, think about if you're leading an organization having more progressive practices that, are, that support reproductive rights? Uh, how can you think about what you do differently? Can you think about test driving an electric vehicle? Can you think about planting a tree. So what I'd like you to do is just, as you're going home tonight, as you're leaving this venue, think about one discrete action that you can take uh, that can make the world a better place, but also can help address uh, climate change uh, in your own world. So thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Uh, we invite those of you here in the audience uh, to the rooftop deck on a beautiful day in San Francisco uh, for some treats that uh, Diana Hagen has provided. We have a, a, a flat of cheese that she's provided and some drinks and we would, uh, we would uh, thank you Diana and, and thank you all for being here uh, and hopefully we'll see you on the roof for a nice uh, soiree. Thank you.